Log Talk Radio. Welcome, welcome to Morris Talk Live 100. I'm your host, Tahaka Armana L. Bay, and tonight our special guest is Brother Stanley Scott. He's an activist right here in Jacksonville, Florida, where we live, and we're going to be dealing with your health benefits and your economic future. Keep in mind, it's a good idea for you to have paper and pencil because I have books that I'm going to read into the broadcast. But before we get started, I'm going to go to the commercials and we'll come right back. Uh, then we're ready to go in. Okay? Hold on. The greatest move you can make beginning in 2022 is to move out of the public and into the private. That's how you get rid of student loans child support, mortgages, foreclosures, and all this kind of business. Go to TahakaDebtElimination.org. That's TahakaDebtElimination.org. Fill out my contact us form by leaving your email address, and I'll rush my free report straight to your email box. Our economy is in shambles today for people who insist on living in the public. Move into the private. Make an easy transaction. Go to www.tahakadebtelimination.org. That's tahakadebtelimination.org. Fill out the contact us form and I'll rush you my free report. Okay, everybody, we'll get to the rest of the commercial later on. It appears that my guest is in the queue and we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. And I'm going to open up the uh, phone lines and let him in at Eric Code 404. Eric Code 404, you're on the air. Tell us who you yes, are, where you're calling uh, from. Yes, yeah, Stanley Scott from Jacksonville, Florida, uh, with the African American Economic. Brother. Yes, yes, yes. Happy to be online with you, and uh, we uh, we'll be sharing some great information. But you have been doing that for years. I'm just glad oh, that yeah. I'm able to support you. Okay. Well, uh, for the uh, newcomers here uh, this evening, because the switchboard is beginning to light up and stuff, uh, uh, why don't you uh, give us a little background information on you? And uh, you got the African American Economic Recovery Think Tank Forum. You could tell us about that. And uh, what you guys are actually doing, uh, before we get on down into this health thing, I want to deal with this health stuff uh, first, and then we'll get on down into the economics. But uh, you have the floor. Absolutely. Uh, there are four pillars, four community pillars with the African-American Economic Recovery Think Tank. Number one is dealing with the uh, family infrastructure. Yes, let me, number one is rebuilding the family infrastructure. Number two, we deal with Afrocentric education. When I talk about Af African uh, Afrocentric education, I'm talking from the bottom up. And I mean, as far as the mother, as soon as she do her thing with the, the child, the baby, uh, we get to work as far as education. And I'd like to be very brief on that point. Uh, Good example is the music uh, that make a big impact in the education of the child. Uh, moving to number three, preventive health. 
That means that we eat from the ground to the top, to the tree. Let me say that again. African people, African people eat from the ground and the tree. The reason why we have a lot of problems is because we're not meaningless. We don't, we're not deep into meat. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, number four, collective, what you can do in your own community. Uh, just briefly, in the African American community, urban core of Jacksonville, Florida, is basically the same as the country. African Americans are sitting on their gold. Uh, not collectively working together to make it happen. Passing it back to you, brother. All right, my brother. Um, let me uh, uh, state uh, uh, what my position is as is, is far as that uh, based on the uh, research and stuff that we have done, uh, I am personally and not uh, quite a few of us here in this country. We have uh, come into the knowledge here recently, the information has been coming out involving our, our identity and stuff. I'm uh, not an African, and uh, there's no one in my family as far back as we can go, as far as my great-grandmother and, and all of these people, and my grandmother's sisters are still alive. And uh, they all tell me the same thing. We heard uh, about the... Uh, a thing about slavery and stuff, but uh, that didn't have anything to do with us. We were already here. And uh, what we have done now is created a uh, college curriculum. And this college curriculum, we, we put in uh, the truth involving our identity in this hemisphere, on this land, uh, which most people, uh, well, a lot of people now are waking up to the fact that this is Turtle Island. But uh, we go further than that. Uh, but we're going to get down into this stuff here and uh, open it up. But the first thing that I want to deal with, because you mentioned about um, uh, our people and their health and stuff. And uh, what I do, uh, I personally, uh, on a regular basis, is I know that if I cook anything at all, uh, and it reaches a temperature of 118 degrees Fahrenheit, all the nutrition and stuff in there is dead. So what I have to do is I have to supplement what I'm going to uh, put in the, in, in the body, and I do that with moringa powder. Uh, and then uh, I deal with fasting, but when I do the fasting, I use what's called harikake fruit. Now, you can... Uh, go over there to YouTube and type it in. That's uh, 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 I get it from our uh, Dr. Bombay products and all cop capital letters. If you type it in uh, into Google, it'll uh, in all capital. You spell the word D O C T O R B O M B A Y products and all dot com in all caps. And uh, you get over there. Haritaki. It comes uh, with 30 pieces in the bag. You take seven pieces of that Haritaki fruit. Take a gallon jug of water, put them seven pieces in and let it sit overnight, and then you want to drink as much as your body can hold. But as far as the fasting is concerned, uh, there are days uh, for the past three weeks, uh, shoot, I, I drink it all day and all night I for a glass. And what it does is whatever is in your body that is wrong, uh, this will uh, take care of it. This is the king of the plant kingdom. It's called Haritaga fruit, and you can get all the skinny on that. Uh, but those are the two things I do uh, over and above uh, going outside and uh, uh, dealing with the sunshine and uh, proper breathing, breathing and, and peace of mind and uh, staying busy dealing with uh, my people and their issues involving law. And we're going to get down into that also. But um, you will discover that the more you know about nutrition, for instance, uh, a lot of people don't know that from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock a.m., uh, if you would just simply eat a variety or a melody of fruit, uh, that will put you much, much farther away before you begin 
to uh, deal with lunch because everything that you put in your mouth has to be chewed until it's liquid in order for you to feed, feed your cells. So you want to get you a blender, you want to get you a juicer, and you can put your uh, uh, fruits and vegetable combination together. But the most important part of it is you want the chlorophyll. You want to have more vegetation than you do with the natural sugars, and uh, that will give you strength and energy and endurance. And uh, it slows down the aging process. Uh, it gives you the stam stamina you needed and the clear clarity of thinking and uh, so on and so forth. But anyway, that is my position. Now, uh, uh, Brother Scott, could you uh, give us some in-depth information on the African American Economic Recovery Think Tank Forum? Absolutely. Absolutely. The African American Economic Think Tank is for the African American community. Uh, go, I got back to back up just a little bit when you were talking about uh, the Africans who was already here. I'm a Gully Geechee. We uh, go back 15,000 years on this land, uh, along with others. But uh, when it comes to the health, uh, I, I like to see you on that subject for a second here. African Americans are not doing the research, they are not really talking to each other. I'm, I'm coming from that point of view here because that's, that's very important. Our parents shared information with each other, our grandparents before that. Today, we own the Internet, and we are not sharing information. I'm talking about quality information. Yes. So. Uh, uh, when it comes to the African American Economic Recovery Thank you. uh information and when I talk about information, they have to be collective information, uh, to make an impact. The thing change do the research. My PA has to do a trick the information. They don't have to buy into it. They do not have to do it. What I'm talking about Stan, it sound like you sound hold hold on Stan, it sound like your phone is breaking up or going in and out of or something. Are you, are you uh, on a speaker? Yes, that's probably what it is. Let me go to the switch over to the phone. Okay. Yes. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. What about now? Okay, you come across clear, crystal clear. Okay, when it comes to the African American think tank, oh, we are holistic. So whatever has to do with the African American community, if we don't have the information, we would do the research for the African American community. That's online only. It says it requires to be physical. Uh, but when it, when it comes to our people, we are just not reading them. And I'm talking about the leadership. I'm not talking about uh, the regular. That's what we deal with when it comes to the, uh, the think tank. And we deal with civic, the government, on all levels. Uh, for, but we advocate for African American concerns. Yes, can you? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Now, now, okay. All right. Now, what is your uh, take on? Uh, uh, what is your position? On our, our nutrition, what we should, in, in your opinion, what should we uh, do? What what you got on that? No, you are more in depth uh, than I when it comes to that. So see, I would take, uh, I back up a little bit and listen to what you're saying because I have read the information what you're speaking of, and it's true. Okay. Yes. All right, well, well, yes, well, let me go ahead and uh, drop this little bit of information. And you could, uh, what I would r like to recommend from some people to run some tests. Let's take uh, butter, uh, and then on the other hand, let's take margarine. Now, uh, you could take a stick of butter and I'll get you a little, little, little uh, tray. You've seen the little butter trays and put your stick in that uh, butter in there. And then get you another tray and get you a stick of margarine. And you can put it on a place where you know you got bugs and rats and stuff. And uh, leave it in there 
uh, for a day or two. And uh, when you come back, you will discover that the butter is gone. But the margarine has not been touched uh, because we're dealing with plastic. And what people have to understand today is that uh, uh, when you go uh, to your grocery store, uh, <laughs> uh, there is no food in there. <laughs> and uh, what you think is food uh, has absolutely no nutritional value, and the reason being is because of uh, the soil erosion and overplanting and violation of the natural laws involving uh, growing plants and stuff. So what we have to do is whatever it is that we get out of the grocery store, uh, and the reason I'm using that analogy is because that's what most of us do. We still want convenience. We want to go into grocery stores. We do not uh, want to grow our own food so we'll know exactly uh, what's in it. Uh, we go to the grocery store, and when you get stuff out of there, you're going to have to supplement whatever it is that you need. Now, you know the body is made out of cells, and everything that you put in your mouth have to be chewed uh, until it turns into a liquid. Uh, each spoonful have to be chewed, according to scientists, at least 108 times. Well, you know we don't do that. So uh, what we have to do is make sure that whatever we are doing, uh, we're going to have to have nutrition added to it. So uh, if you get your uh, turmeric, you get your, uh, uh, get your uh, moringa powder, and there are other supplements that you can put nutrition into the food. Now, and the same thing goes for whatever you are going to put in a blender, if you're going to, if you're going to blend your fruits and vegetables, uh, if you're going to juice raw fruits and vegetables, you can add some of that to whatever it is that you're blending. And what that will do is it will actually feed the cells and you become naturally uh, active and healthy and strong and alert and alive uh, when we do that. Now, um, I've told this story many, many times when I was working on a job, and the only thing that I was doing was juicing number of raw fruits and vegetables. I was not eating anything at all. It's time for me to go to work. I get a, a, a giant cup of raw uh, 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 parsley, spinach, apples, chunk of ginger root, maybe do some kale. Uh, uh, and, and, and other things and drink that down. And when I go to work uh, at 11 o'clock at night, I'm performing from 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still alert and uh, go and get a bucket of water and mop the entire department that I worked in. And the people couldn't understand uh, how is this guy able to function in this capacity without any type of showing any type of, 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 of slowing down or fatigue. They couldn't figure it out because they did not know that the body is made of cells and the way you feed your body is you feed the cells and the only way you can do that is through liquid. So they, uh, even though they watched me come to work, I did not put anything in the snack machine to get any, 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 any potato chips, any cookies, or anything out of that. And uh, then uh, since they was seem to be in the dark. They said, well, we don't never see you eat anything. You don't never bring no lunch. And I said, well, okay, I tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start bringing some lunch so you can see that. So what I would do is I would come in, <laughs> I'll bring me a cantaloupe, and I'll bring uh, a, a little thing of strawberries. I might bring a slice of watermelon. I might bring some honeydew, uh, peaches, plums, and, uh, and uh, I'll sit down and eat that. And it got to the point that one of the engineers, he was a white guy, he came in there and he looked at me sitting to the table eating the strawberries. He said, I need to ask you something. I said, well, what's that? He said, do you ever eat anything unhealthy? And he was, he, it was like, you're causing me a problem because you're, you're, you're not being corrupt and I'm not accustomed to that. And uh, I said, well, uh, are you all right? Well, well I said, yeah, I'm just fine, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we've got all these snacks in here. You don't ever buy anything out of there. You, I don't see you with any, any, any place with any rice or peas or chicken or no pork chops, no, uh, you know. And I said, well, you seem to 
uh, be upset about. Well, I'm not upset. I'm just asking. I said, well, I just told you. Uh, I'm, I'm eating. You see me eating. I'm eating. Yeah, but that's nutrition. I said, we have a problem. Where you want me to die? Where, where is your problem? <laughs> so no, I had asking. another yeah. brother. Now this brother came to me, and man, he was excited. He said, man, he said, I heard you don't eat no meat. I said, no, I don't eat any meat. Man, you better hurry up and eat some meat before it's too late. <laughs> it was the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. So I said, man, look here. Our people are in trouble. <laughs> They're right. in trouble. And, you know, Elijah Muhammad put out a book a while back called How to Eat to Live. And he says right. that a man shouldn't eat no more than a fistful of food on any given day. And uh, that's right. absolutely correct. And I'm, I'm, I feel like this, Stanley. Okay, this is what I see, just common sense. If I was born with this body, I got a brain in my head, and, 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 and that my head is located on my shoulders. Everywhere I go, I carry it with me. I got to put it to bed. I got to wake it up. I got to... Uh, go to school with it, get out of school with it. I, everything that I do, I got to carry this with me. And so that means that if I'm going to function properly, I have to take care of this. I shouldn't have to call somebody else to tell me about my body that I own, who don't know, who don't even know, know my name. I shouldn't have to do that. I, what I should be able to do is take the time to learn everything that I could possibly learn about myself and my body and the functions of how I work because I got to carry this thing with me all my life. And everything that I do, I'm going to have to have this with me. So why would I, and this is what people do, they refuse to learn anything about themselves. They refuse to learn anything about the functioning of the body and their mind and their brain and, their, and, and anything else, and they rely on the doctors and nurses and hospitals to tell them about themselves. This is amazing, and we have not stopped to, to think about that. Here's somebody that you don't know. Uh, you ain't never seen in your life. You go in there uh, with Doc, uh, I ain't feeling good. Well, uh, well, we're going to run some tests. And then the, the doctor run a test and he said, well, uh, I'm prescribing some medicine for you, and uh, the medicine is uh, $50. Uh, you take that. When you could have uh, went out there in your uh, backyard and pull up some natural herbs and uh, ate that or either went to the grocery store and got you some uh, fruits and vegetables and took that and uh, 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 create your own life with it because the life of the body is in the bowels. So if the bowels are clean and, and, and purging stuff, then you got life. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is an amazing uh, enigma uh, to me why after all these years I've been preaching this uh, gospel and people are still doing the same thing. Uh, I'm going to eat me some uh, pork chops. Uh, 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 I, I, they got uh, uh, neck bones on sale. <laughs> at the grocery store. But anyway, uh, Stanley, hold on a minute. Uh, I'm finna uh, 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 go take a little come quick back. break. Yes. Huh? And, I, and when we come back, yes, because then we, I, then we yes. get down in here. Yeah, I'd like to see something. Yes, yes. Okay, well, well, hold on a minute, and we'll be right back. Yes. Well, I'm Laila Africa, and yes, I studied natural medicine, and I wrote the book African Holistic Health and another book about the political use of food called Nutricide. So my whole area is just health as it concerns black people. And uh, we had a position where we have to defend our health because it's constantly being attacked by such uh, things as some sugar-coated buns. <laughs> and we're, we are being we're being seduced into our own destruction mm. in a happy way with cartoon characters. So basically, our diet is being controlled by clowns and cartoon characters. Mm. You see, we're not using intelligence as African people. We are very intelligent people. We 
go pyramids, create a calculus. We have to use our intelligence to help us get out of this situation because we're being manipulated manipulated by this industry. Okay, Doc. Yes. I mean, sugar. Why can't I have sugar? Why can't I not have sugar? I mean, why can't I have my, my candy bars and my peppermint and, you know, my, my chips and all my, you know, my, my different flavored colored candies? I like candy. Uh, sugar is naturally in sugar cane. It's naturally in oranges and apples. But when you take the sugar out of the sugar cane, you've isolated and concentrated a substance. And that's called a drug. That's what we call a drug. So you mean I'm like a, I'm like a drug addict when I keep going to the bodega and getting my candy every day? Well, you're a drug addict. That's bona fide. You have an eating disorder because you, you're eating all the time. If you drink all the time, you have a drinking problem. If you smoke all the time, you have a smoking problem. Now you're eating all the time, now you have an eating problem, which is a mental illness. The, the sugar, as long as it's in the sugar cane, it doesn't bother you. But when you take it out of the sugar cane, now you have problems. Because mm. the body is going to try to make it whole before it's digested. So it's going to pull wart out of your veins and arteries and nervous system. Mm. What I'm saying is if you eat a raisin, the body is going to turn it back into a grape before it's digested. Mm. So it's going to put the water back into the raisin and make it into a grape. Mm. So it pulls this wart out of your nervous system, which causes Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, mm. multiple sclerosis. And it also pulls the moisture out of your joints, causing arthritis and stiff veins and arteries, arterial sclerosis. But the main thing that it's causing is you not to be in control of yourself. Mm. You got a chemical in your body that's giving you a false sense of intelligence. Mm. But I control my own thoughts. Oh, yes, you certainly do. You control your own thoughts. That's what you think. Mm. Your thoughts are this. You like sugar, so you eat sugar. So why is it that you like sugar? Who told you to like sugar? Mm. Who taught you all of this? So your feelings were created for you. Mm. Someone told you how to feel. If you eat this candy bar, you feel good. Mm. Your feelings are connected to this candy bar forever. So soul food, you know, that's a big thing with us guys. We <laughs> love soul food, you know. Yeah. That's known as a scavenger diet where you eat the scraps, the leftover. Scraps? scraps. It tastes uh, good, though. We don't want to eat this place, all right? We want to eat the food the way God made it. To keep us the way God made us. We want to eat the whole food. People think it's some new thing. It was invented by Africans. We call it nutrition. Now, Doc, uh, you know, what's wrong with me taking a little, oh. you know, a little, 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 little sippy yeah, sip every so often yeah. for my homies, you know what I'm saying? Drink a little beverage, yeah. you know what I'm saying? A little alcohol, you know, a little malt liquor. Just, you know, what's wrong with that? Cotton candy is the dextrose with maltodextrin. Sugar, maltodextrin. Sugar is addicting. Wow. Cause your teeth to rot out. Cause you to be hyperactive. Wow. What about colors? Red forty, lake, and Those yellow five. Those cause allergic reaction, inflammation of the vagina, the teeth, the penis, the prostate. Yeah. Okay. Calcium stearate. Yeah. That's another chemical. What these I chemicals? Was calcium though. These chemicals released under the Nuremberg trial. These chemicals come out of Germany under the Merck Drug Company. They call them behavior modifiers. Today you call them conservative and additives. You have to read the my behavior. Of course, that's what it's about. They, they can't addict you to an apple. You can't get addicted to celery. Are you crazy? They, they can only addict you to this thing if they got sugar in it. So I, basically, I'm a junkie. I'm a sugar junkie. You're worse than a sugar junkie. You're hyperactive. Mm. Because sugar will speed you up. But what's wrong with the honey bun? I the eat honey, honey bun. bun. All the food shapes were designed by the Greeks, mm. and they have they have sexual connotations to them. That's why they call them buns. Mm. That's wow. why they call them buns. You're eating the asshole of someone else. Wow. You're into a symbolic homosexualism of sorts. Wow. That's why they call them buns. That's why candy bars are named after men. This is the good bar, Snickers, Musketeers, mm. Babe Ruth. They all chocolate penises with nuts on them. Whoa. So you're symbolically eating a, a chocolate penis, you see, and you break it open, ejaculates caramel, it's got nuts on it. Damn. I mean, it's, 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 the food was designed by someone alien to you, so it alienates you from yourself. Mm. See, it's no accident that a, a hot dog is shaped like a penis, and then you stick it between two buns. It's no accident. You wow. See? It's all about feelings. It's not about intelligence. So, what it, so this symbology, how does it affect the minds of the youth? Oh, very How easily. Does it shape very them? easily. It, if you're gonna if you're gonna raise like a, a pork, a people call pork. I'm saying, but you raise a pig, mm -hmm. and you want to raise the pig fast, you give it steroids and sex hormones. Mm -hmm. So when you eat the pig, you're eating steroids and sex hormones. Mm -hmm. Then you become chemically addicted to sex. Mm -hmm. 
one of the most chemicalized animals they're around is beef and that pig. Mm. So in some ways they want to get you into eating beef and pig in any form. They can call it ham or pork rinds and mm. all that kind of stuff, but you're eating the chemicals. This industry called the food industry is a military control industry. Mm. And to them, you are the enemy. You're the person they're supposed to capture. Mm. So the industry has been set up long ago, 1946, to attack you. Mm. That's what it's about. It's not nothing innocent, not in this country. Everything is about attacking you. The air will kill you. All right, everybody, we're back. Just want to drop that little piece of nugget right there. That's uh, Dr. Lila O. Africa. Uh, <laughs> they murdered him uh, because he uh, uh, refused to uh, uh, get out of the uh, uh, business of telling the truth. Uh, they also murdered Dr. Save, and there were many other holistic doctors that they killed. Uh, and then after they was able to get rid of all of them, then they came out uh, with the coronavirus. And uh, the most amazing thing about that is uh, the coronavirus, uh, what it was, uh, 2019, but you would discover after you do the research that uh, governments around the world will buy test kits for the coronavirus in 2018 before the virus ever hit. Uh, do the math, y'all. Anyway, I'm going to go and uh, open up my uh, uh, guest phone lines and bring it back on in. Okay, Stanley uh, Scott, you still with me, brother? Absolutely. All right, what's your take on Dial Lala Africa, man? Well, I wanted to back up a, just a little bit here. We, we, we're talking about the food here. Uh, okay. Let's do that. Uh, first part here, that you have the opportunity, well, you and I, I see you and I, to help our people. Uh, not all of them, because they are no set, but the ones who are conscious and have open mind, they want this information. Yes, and then we can. That's also a financial opportunity too. I would say yes for business, but because our people the wrong information here. Uh, that's part one. Uh, number two here. We are you and I, for example, a living example of taking care of yourself. A lot of people may not, uh, well, they can't see that. So. But we've been living like that for a long period of time. I do too. I work out the whole nine yards. I don't just, it's just not the food, but you have to work out too, especially when you get over, really over 50, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, you need to have some type of activity going on with your life. And a lot of our old people, yes, and they, they just seem that uh, into that TV here. Uh, but that's part of being preventable with your health. And probably not going to get it, but there's quite a few people out there want this information. But for some reason, we have not really taken care of the uh, 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 the Internet to get that information out. You see, basic, you see two things on the media out there when it comes to the African community. It's that drama, right, and part of telling you what you need to do with your life. I mean, how many people need to tell you about your life before you can get on the right track? I don't want that part. Yes, but uh, I want to share that part with you here because we have to be about it now. We can't be talking about it. And I think you and I are in a position to make a difference. Yes, uh, in our communities. And country. Well, I, I, think you, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I bet I've been at uh, this uh, kind of stuff that I'm doing for quite some time, and I found out that uh, when we uh, put this information out, uh, there are quite a few people that actually get this stuff, and our people are like this here. It is amazing to me. I can put out, um, let's say, uh, one, two, three, four, five blog talk shows a month but the listening audience when it's time for me to start over next month uh they they haven't listened to no no more than one or two of the shows and they, they they're gonna get around to the third one but see the thing is 
the information has been done, is put out on the major networks, is all over the United States and everywhere else. Uh, they've called me from Germany. They've called me from Afghanistan. They called me from the Dominican Republic. They called me from Mexico. They called me from Hawaii. So I know that the information is going where it needs to go. And after we lead these horses to the water, then uh, that's as far as we can go. Uh, we can't make them go no further. It's not a point of them, uh, us not reaching them. The information is out there. And I've had uh, brothers and sisters call me and say, well, Brother Tarko, I've been listening to you uh, since 2012. And then they called me again and said, well, man, when you going to uh, be back on and uh, so I can get some more, more, more of this information. So um, I'm at ease. I know uh, that what we are doing here, as long as the Internet is available, and I encourage them to uh, go ahead and download this information and put it on an external hard drive and stuff so you can go back and uh, re-look at it. Then we take, uh, just like I was saying at the uh, outset of the broadcast, I think that, uh, number one, every brother in America and Susan need to have their own library in their house, their own book library in their house, and you also need to create your own college curriculum. And uh, the way I've done this stuff, and I invested a lot of time, is to put it on uh, 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 your external hard drive so you can take that and uh, plug it in your TV, and uh, you can look at the proper programming and stuff and learn this stuff and make it available to your children, your grandchildren, and your great-great-grandchildren. And uh, I've had a tremendous amount of success in doing that, and we have daycares, uh, out there in the neighborhood, and what the daycares are starting to do now, they're starting to wake up. Instead of you dropping your child off to the daycare and they just keeping your child and they playing all day long and then you come back and pick them up, well, what these daycare people are doing now is they are teaching these children inside of the daycare and they're teaching them about their culture and their ancient stories stuff like that so that's super fantastic and uh, then they can get on over into nutrition and health and uh, stuff like that so uh we are being effective and uh at my age I'm I'm, doing the stuff that i'm doing and i'm living it i know i'm with you with that part because i live it too but the point i'm talking about I look at it. That's what I do. That's what the think tank. We we research. So I read the data. Now I understand what's going on. That's what I'm, I'm saying here. I have the data, and the data is is available to anybody who wants it. What I'm talking to you about here, because we we understand that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far and make an impact, go together. And what I'm saying to you. I appreciate what you're doing. That's why I reach out to you. What I want to talk to you about is how can we put together strategy to move to the next level for our community. Well, um, I, <laughs> me personally, I already got a strategy, and I've been using the most effective what? strategy that I could possibly use. But now, 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 let me say this right here, Stanley, because a lot of brothers and sisters. <laughs> Uh, they feel like, and I don't already been there, and I've narrowed this thing down to what, what works. I've been all over this city, and I have uh, I've been all over the United States. I used to uh, be on the circuit. I traveled uh, up through Georgia, all the way up to South and North Carolina, all the way to Virginia, swing all the way over to Tennessee, down in the Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Miami, and all, all over teaching. And I was able to touch a lot, a lot of people, uh, but it took its toll on me. And I said, well, look, how can I do what I'm doing and be more effective without all the wear and tear? So um, 
I decided to uh, do this thing from the position that I'm doing in, and out where I am, I grow my own food so that they can see it, see what I'm doing, imitate what I'm doing. If they got any questions, I can guide them along and, 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 and explain it to them. But as far as uh, going out, setting up something here in Jacksonville and doing this, that, and the other, uh, uh, I suggest that you don't do that. You're wasting your time. That's just my position. I can understand that. I can re understand that. I can respect that. But my concern with you at this present time is us sharing information with each other because that's the way we are because we don't know what each other are really doing until we talk to okay, each other. Okay, well, I didn't. Well, 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 hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, brother. Now, hold go on. Ahead, go ahead. Hold on. Go ahead. Because I'm not just talking about you and I. I'm talking about the people who are listening and being able to share information. And what I'm saying here, I understand what you're doing, but if the two of us, because that's one of the biggest problems in our community today. We got too many Lone Rangers running around here. I mean, I, I see that financially on all four levels. I see the same thing. We got we got long ranges. We are not running as a collective group. We can do more. We can achieve more. Yes. And and as you say, well, the way the way you're doing, I'm trying to make sure I understand the way you're doing. You're happy with that. Yes. Oh yeah. And I can respect it. I I'm, hold on now. I respect that. So all I'm saying is I don't want to share what I have and, and, look, and look at what you have and see how we can move to the next level. Now, because I haven't told you what I really do. Yes. And, but I can show my information. Yes, it's available just like you. I got 80 YouTube videos over there. Uh, 80. I got an old... Uh, 30,000 people to follow this program that uh, I'm, I'm using for information-wise. So I'm saying we can bring that knowledge we have, your knowledge, my knowledge, and help our community. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. It ain't well, okay, about well, me. It ain't about, right, well, that's, it's about moving forward. What we're well, what we going to have to do is uh, we're going to have to discuss this. Uh, uh, right. And we'll, we'll do that uh, off the uh, off the air. we sit down and because see, right. there's, there's a difference in uh, uh, I'm doing things, I'm, but let me let me go ahead and finish up this health thing, and then we get down into the economics and stuff, and uh, then I'll right. explain uh, what my position is. So hold on a minute, I'm gonna mute your mic, and then we'll be right back. As a 40-year-old oh, black woman, I have an intimate understanding of how it feels not to be believed by your healthcare provider. Hi, my name is Joy Altamari, and I'm Chief Engagement and Brand Officer at EHE Health. This is a word about how, when equitable and holistic healthcare is available to communities of color, we all benefit. I think in this country, we've seen specific issues around healthcare and people of color from the beginning of time. There's definitely what we call lack of awareness around how people of color feel, how they feel emotionally and physically, but also what they're coming to the table with. This perspective that we're all the same is common, I think, with the healthcare industry. And it's rooted in really the history of how the healthcare industry has disregarded people of color. We look at things like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. They were without knowledge and without permission monitoring groups of people who had syphilis and telling them they were giving them something to help them with it, but really they were letting it run rampant. And that disregard for human life, that disregard for community, for the black community, I think is part of this trust and part of the dissatisfaction that most people of color have with the healthcare. When we think about women like Henrietta Lacks, who died at 31, and the issue there is that she was going in because she felt something was wrong, and they were, again, without permission and without even transparency, taking pieces of her cervix for testing and for other reasons. That is the shared history this country has around healthcare and people of color. Moments in time where people are being told that the healthcare industry is doing something to save them or to make them feel better, but really the reality is that they're going behind the scenes and they're actually, again, without permission, 
taking pieces of people's bodies. We should be able to provide access from womb to tomb to every human being, yet we don't. And we think about why that exists. Obviously, it's rooted in racism, sexism. It's rooted in all of these things that have plagued our country since its beginning. COVID has really highlighted the inequalities that exist in healthcare, but they didn't start today. The inequalities in healthcare began many, many, many years ago, and what we're feeling is the effect of ignoring those inequalities and not coming up with policies to combat them. Today, we see you know over 217,000 Americans have died from COVID. And when we look at that information, we know that African Americans are dying at two to three times more than their white counterparts. Why is that? COVID is a very nasty disease that it really attacks those with one, two, three risk factors. If you have diabetes, if you have chronic heart disease, and you catch COVID, the likelihood of you surviving is much lower than a healthier human being or a healthier American. So after listening to all this, especially, you know, it can sound very dire, is there hope for the future? And I say yes, a resounding yes. Why? Because first of all, we know that people are talking about it more and more. The fact that it's on everyone's radar, the fact that we are bringing a heightened awareness to the inequalities that exist in healthcare and how they have had dire effects on people of color. The fact that we're talking about it so proudly, so openly, is step number one. But more importantly, step number two, we will move into action. We see small companies, large companies, we see nonprofit companies really coming together to join their voices and talk about and demand policy change. Many people of color, especially across the country, have had an experience where they felt they weren't heard or listened to. When you can gather together and share that experience, when you can gather together and strategize and amplify your voices to those that can make policy change. We should be focused really on understanding the policies that are gonna be put into place that will help or hurt us for generations to come. My hope is that people are using this time to educate themselves as they go into the healthcare system, they're becoming advocates for themselves. They're demanding that their employers provide ample, not only access, but options and that they're really using their dollars as their voice to say, I will or will not participate in something that doesn't take care of me holistically, that doesn't think of my family as an important part of the American culture. If they can do that, then the future will be bright.
right, everybody, we're back um, uh, tonight. Uh, my special guest is uh, Brother Stanley Scott. Uh, he runs the African American Economic Recovery Think Tank. That's just part of what he do. Uh, he is also an uh, activist right here in Jacksonville, Florida. And we're just chopping it up uh, a bit tonight. Uh, we're talking about health, uh, our health benefits, and, uh, and then we're going to be uh, de going to be dealing with uh, your economic future. So we're going to get on down into the economics, and uh, I have to deal with this uh, from uh, 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 my perspective based on what I know and what we what we do as Moors here in the United States uh, operating in the private. We're going to uh, discuss a little bit of that. I'm going to open up his phone line so we can get on in. But uh, before we do that, I'm going to go over here and run this next commercial. And when we're done, uh, then we're going to come back. I need you to uh, hold on a minute. We'll be right back. As okay? a secured party and creditor, can you buy a home, a car, and other items you need and want? The answer is yes. And there are documents you use to do just that. Catch my radio podcast at Blog Talk Radio. Go to TahakadetElimination.org. Fill out the box with your email address that say join our mailing list, and I will send you my free report. You got credit problems? Contact me at TahakadetElimination.org. Let's stay in honor and get into the private. All right, everybody, we're back. I'm going to open up uh, my guest's uh, phone line, Brother Stanley Scott. Brother Scott, you still with me? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, because I want to right. listen. I want to listen to uh, your reduction, credit reduction. Yes. That's a big need in our community. <laughs> well, of course it is. Uh, but uh, let, me, let, me, let me explain something uh, to you, Stanley. Uh, I've already invested uh, a great deal of time uh, mm -hmm. into the East in doing what I do. And right. my statistics show me that, uh, and I'm being absolutely honest, I know there's a lot of people uh, here in the state of Florida and in Duval County and Jacksonville uh, they have learned a lot of things. In fact, uh, they contacted uh, uh, us uh, down there in Orlando. The uh, Orlando Police Department wanted us to come down there in person to teach them and see what the problem is this right here. Now, Stanley, this is the problem. You need to break down on this here so you understand what my position is. Inside the United States, we have two things. We have public and private. Now, everybody knows about the public, but the problem is a lot of us don't know about the private. Also, we have uh, a conglomerate of corporations inside the United States masquerading as a government. Okay, for instance, uh, my identity, as it appears with me being on this land, first of all, I'm absolutely original to the land, uh, indigenous to the land. I'm not a native. I've always been here when the natives showed up. But anyway, um, I live in the private. I only deal, because see, you got two more things. You got vertical issues and you got horizontal issues. I only deal with vertical issues. I am a citizen of Florida State Republic. I did not say I was a citizen of the state of Florida. I didn't say that. I said Florida State Republic. There's private and there's public. Now, when it comes to functioning in the private, and this is a, uh, I've been teaching this right here for a long, long, long time. 
but it involves three very scary things to our people. I mean, it's scary. And these three scary things are reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is where right. the train get off the track. But let me go back and finish saying what I'm saying. First of all, uh, we have lawyers. A lawyer deals with statutes and ordinances and legalese. The law don't show up until you do. The United States is a conglomerate of corporations. And according to the rules and regulations governing corporations, the only thing that a corporation can deal with is another corporation. So what they do is they turn you into a corporation in order to do business with you. That is why every bill or every document or your bank statement, your light bill, your gas bill, your water bill, or any other company that you're doing business with, uh, have your name on it in all capital letters. That is why when you go to the cemetery, all the gravestones in there and the writing on the gravestones is in all capital letters because they're corpse. Now, you and I both went to a uh, third grade grammar. Our teacher taught us the difference between a proper noun and an improper noun. A proper noun, when it comes to a man and a woman, is always spelled in upper and lowercase letters. But what did they teach us about when all the letters are capital, that indicates anything other than a living, breathing man or woman. That's a corpse, a corporation, chattel, property, slave, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's easy enough for us to understand, but how are we going to take this stuff and put it in the reading, writing, and arithmetic and actually use it and functioning? Now, I'm just giving you bits and pieces of this stuff for my position. If you are in the private, how are you going to be a resident? And why do you have uh, an address on your house if you're in the private? Why would you uh, need a, a, a driver license when the Lord had already told you you had the freedom of right to travel? And you buy an automobile, it's automatically registered to the state. So you're going to have to deregister that. You're going to have, if you got a driver's license, you're going to give them back to them, opt out that contract, and let them know, hey, we're looking here. You know, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate you, man. But uh, I'm going to just live as a living, breathing man or woman. Anytime you walk in the courtroom, there's the uh, judge sitting up there on the bench, and over there to his right or left or wherever he got it at, uh, there's the United States American flag. But around the fringes of that flag, you see the yellow fringes. You know what that means? That means that you're in a court of admiralty. It ain't got nothing to do with the law. It's all about business. And a lot of us are up in there uh, talking about, uh, uh, well, I, I'm going to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty or no contest. What the heck are you doing? Uh, the, a corporation can only do business with another corporation. Here you is walking up in there living, breathing on a man, uh, living, breathing woman and a man and agreeing to be dead. And the, uh, then instead of saying, well, look, I'm not in here to enter a plea, I'm in here to settle the tax matter. That's what you're supposed to say. But anyway, uh, do you have another question? No, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm saying I'm following your lead. All right, well, that's so, a little smidget. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, Carl, I'm saying we'll be talking don't, about don't get me preventive tax. <laughs> All right. We talk about preventive health. I mean, that's why when we talk Sound about like it breaking up now. If, oh, 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 keep oh, on me. talking. Keep on talking. No, keep okay, on talking, Stanley. Minutes. Let me do something here. It might be on my end. Keep talking. Okay, uh, preventive health. When we talk about preventive health, it also apply with the economics too of your community, your country. Yes. But when it comes well, I to think that's uh that's fantastic. That's great. Well part. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> so much you, you okay. your health that is that is exactly 
exactly the way that I did it. And uh, when I found out that uh, uh, we had the right to travel, and uh, and it tells you on the driver's license uh, that belongs to the state of Florida. Uh, when you right. purchase the vehicle, it's registered to the state, and uh, they say you well you need a registration. That's registered to the state. So my question is, well, uh, when am I going to be free? Well, the only person can free you is you. But you're going to have to right. deal with some scary stuff. And that scary stuff is reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's right. where the train derailed. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, no. when you when – you, when you, okay – now, in, inside the United States, we have a, a whole nother language that people still haven't figured out. The language is called legalese. Now, legalese deals with statutes and ordinances, rules, and regulations. Those statutes and ordinances, and rules, and regulations are exactly what they say they are but they have absolutely nothing to do with the law. Now, let me state the law for you. The law states that you can do anything you want to do, provided you do not destroy or harm or kill or take the life of another man or woman. And number two, the law states that you do not destroy, harm, or hurt the property of another man and woman. That's it. That is the law. Now, you know I just told you the United States uh, is a conglomerate of corporations operating and masquerading as a country. And, is, right. and we perform a phenomenon. Every year we perform this phenomenon. We go to the voting booth and vote for the president of the United States Corporation. We didn't, and it's amazing because when uh, Walmart and Sears and J.C. Penney and all of these uh, corporations had a new, new president for their company, we didn't run over there and vote them in, but because we still under the impression that the United States is a country. No, it's a conglomerate of corporations. The only thing a corporation can do business with is another corporation. That's why every time you get a bill in the mail, it's addressed to a corporation in all capital letters. Now, you know something going on because when the junk mail come in, you look at your name and stuff down there, it's in an open little case letter. They're trying to get your business. But keep in mind, once you start doing business with them, everything turns around to all caps, man. So what you're going to have right. to do is you're going to have to understand the game, the rules of the game, so you can know how to play the game. We got 99.9% uh, .9 of our people locked up in prison and jail voluntarily. They volunteered to go to jail. And the first thing the judge or anybody else going to tell you, there's no excuse for you not knowing the law. There ain't no excuse. And they're right. 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 You're right. So what we got to do is we got to learn this stuff and we got to turn it around. Now, uh, this stuff that I'm talking about tonight, this is elementary. Now, I am not about to tell you about how to go into private and start buying houses and car cars and stuff uh, when you still brain dead. The first thing, <laughs> the first thing anybody gonna have to do when you when you get ready to Let's say let let's say you got uh, uh, some kind of hook or crook or some kind of weight. You don't got to hold the four hundred thousand dollars. All right. Step one: the first thing to do before you go to the store and buy anything, don't buy nothing. You get you contact a business consulting firm, and the first thing they are supposed to do is give you some documents to fill out so you can set your goals, your plans, your 
uh, all of this stuff is step one before we ever get in, into anywhere about using any money about anything. Getting in, in position to manage your life because your name that appears on all capital letters on your birth certificate, that is a trust. You got some skin in the game. The state ain't got none in the game. The only people got something in the game is, is the ones who created the contract with your name on the contract and their name man. ain't. So you are operating as a beneficiary of the contract. You got to turn it around and start operating as a grant on the contract. And you start calling the shots against that trust, man. And stay away from that filling out a wheel. Bump that. Set up a trust, man, and start functioning through a trust. This is how you play the game. This is how you win the game. But we right. got to go back to basics. We got to start dealing with reading, writing, and arithmetic. We got to start from the bottom. We got to come up. You can't just the worst thing that ever happened to a human being to have sudden wealth thrust upon them. And uh, uh, I've seen uh, two or three thousand uh, dollars take people completely out. I've seen five thousand dollars send a brother to his death. Just five thousand dollars, mm -hmm. man, thrust it upon him. And so we right. got to get into position to start to learn, first of all, who you are, second of all, where you are, and how is it that how does the place where you are function? How is it functioning? How does it work? What can yeah. I do to function in the society? And you cannot, there is no way around the reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I'm glad I mentioned that because it's Halloween and it's scary. Because <laughs> that's what Halloween's supposed to be about. <laughs> so now I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just trying to tell you, man, look here. If you no, no, can't you, read, you good. if you right. cannot read, if you cannot write, and you can't count, they got free places for you to go to learn how to do that. Otherwise, you spinning your wheels, you ain't going nowhere. You just a talking head. Right. So uh, that's my uh, mm -hmm. position on that because I cannot uh, just come out and just, you know, because see, our people is, well, you know, just tell me a part, the part about the money. No, 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 no. You ain't finna kill yourself and you ain't finna kill nobody else because you're stuck on stupid. I ain't finna do that. You know, I'm when you contact me, when they contact me, I let them know up front, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you. You know, we're going to do this in a step-by-step, -step, point by pound, point. And, uh, yeah, but, but, but we're going to get to the money. I said, we, we ain't finna get there today. So just sit down and relax. And so you can get some sense in here because if you get the money, you need to know what to do with it. Because we got a whole right. lot of stupid people out there with all kind of money doing all kinds of dumb stuff with that money. <laughs> and another thing, right. there ain't no money in America corporation. We ain't got enough of credit, but that's a whole nother story for a whole different show. But Stanley, hold on a minute, man. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be right back. Y'all y'all hold on a minute, ladies and gentlemen. We're going down into uh the second phase of our broadcast. We'll start dealing with the uh, economics. My special guest is uh, Brother Stanley Scott. He is uh, in charge of the African American Economic Recovery Think Tank Forum, and uh, he's also an activist in Jacksonville, and we're going to uh, have him on but, uh, again. But right now, let's, let's deal with a little bit of these statistics. Y'all hold your head and we'll be right back. From okay? America's black communities on politics and the economy, and the numbers are not good. A poll by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies found that 65% of the people they surveyed earlier this month described their personal economic situations as either fair or poor. Now, even more than that, 65% rated the overall economy as fair or poor. 50% said that they think things in the U.S. have gone seriously off track, while just 45% believe that the country is moving in the right direction. So we're highly divided on how we view our politics and our economy. So uh, here to help us drill down on that poll and what it means in a few different contexts is Dr. Alex Comardell. He's with the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, better known as America's Black Think Tank. Welcome to BNC Live, Dr. Kemadell. How are you today, sir, first of all? 
I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Of course. So let's dive right into it. Why are economic woes hitting us harder in the black community? Yeah, that's a lot to unpack given that history, uh, centuries of uh, economic disadvantage have been imposed on black Americans. And I think right now at this stage, post in a pandemic world where we've experienced a recession in the last couple of years, black folks are not sensing much in terms of recovery. And that was the reason why we wanted to put forward this poll and the results as we're getting close to the president's address, the State of the Union address coming up tomorrow so that we can put a stake in the ground on how black Americans uh, view the direction of their economic uh, uh, situation. Um, and hopefully so that the president could begin to prioritize black Americans more in his policies um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about loan and credit card interest rates paid in black and brown communities compared to other communities. We kind of speculate about this in the black community, but are those rates higher for us than they are for other communities? I think that, uh, well, you see that there are a lot of uh, predatory uh, opportunities out there that exist in black communities, right? Um, I think disproportionately, you find black Americans may turn to loan products. They might not be safe, not, may not be affordable, but it's not necessarily because, you know, they are uh, the best option available. It's because they are systematically, you know, targeting black folks in many different ways um, that makes black folks seem as though they are picking out higher loans, higher rates of debt, uh, with higher interest rates, et cetera. So that's something that, you know, is uh, playing uh, communities, particularly low-income black communities, where you see that predatory uh, uh, predatory nature of debt uh, in, in uh, running rampant there. Mm -hmm. Now, one situation that, you know, has really kind of caused this to grow within black communities and within black families is the equity gap that we missed out on being subsidized by the American government back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, so what would it take to equalize the situation now? And also, how can black and brown people have a part to do in it? What are things that we can do to move the needle in our favor? So we have a lot of work to do in order to even begin to think about equalizing um, the, the wealth gap in this country, right? Um, the wealth disparities are massive uh, compared to between black Americans and white households. And uh, I think that some of the proposals that exist to address it, um, even just to get us closer to some parity in terms of wealth, uh, include um, addressing some of the disparities in home ownership, definitely investing capital into black businesses, but there are other things that are a priority among black Americans, such as canceling student debt. Um, there's a student debt crisis that's definitely impacted the ability of a lot of black families uh, to uh, grow their wealth and their assets so that they can be financially secure in the future. Um, those are things that can't be overlooked when talking about the wealth disparities in this nation because those uh, there have been public policies that have facilitated and reinforced wealth disparities in this country, just as you mentioned, with the history of redlining, with segregation, um, exclusion from banking, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, you know, the education and the information to go along with it all for us to know where we should be looking and how we can actually move things forward. So that's coming from the top down. You know, we're talking high level government and whatnot. Let's start from the bottom up. How can we, people that we see each other out in the streets, what can we do within our communities to make things happen a little bit quicker? Well, I think for one, uh, I'm a huge advocate of advocating and organizing in communities uh, to show up in your municipal government, your state government, et cetera, uh, working through the faith community and other forms of coalitions is one way to get black priorities to be front and center in these policy debates, not just in Washington, D.C., but in your own local community. So that's one of the you know main strategies that I would, I would put forward. But I mean, I think engaging with uh, community media communities like DNC and many others is another way to stay informed. Um, and definitely recommend uh, staying in tune with the Joint Center and our work at jointcenter.org 
to learn more about what issues are affecting black communities across the country. Mm -hmm. No man is an island. No man is an island. It kind of makes me think of Nino Brown, what you just said. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. We should be networking with our community. Right. Well said, Doc. Now, another kind of stifling figure from your poll says that 81% of black Americans said that it is the government's responsibility to reduce the negative impacts of racism on them. Now, that's kind of a kind of a high level big brain thought. What are your thoughts on that idea there? Yeah, well, one of the reasons we wanted to even ask the question is because we know that the federal government has played a role in creating racist policy, right? Like many of the things you've already talked about were um, explicitly designed to exclude black folks from economic opportunity. So uh, putting that question out into the universe and asking black Americans who actually should hold the responsibility for correcting those issues, really uh, shone light on the, the reality that black folks know that the government has played that role, has played the discriminatory role, and you can't fix, uh, you know, race, racist policy with race neutral solutions. And I think that was one of the most um, exciting uh, in, in really, you know, as you mentioned, kind of jarring uh, statistics from our poll is that, you know, black folks recognize that the government played a big role in creating these conditions. It has to play an even bigger role in, in fixing them. Mm -hmm. Now, another large majority of black Americans, some seven out of 10, they plan to watch the State of the Union address. So is this a sign that people are sort of, you know, not waking up, I won't say that. I'll say that you're, they're just paying closer attention to um, how politics affects their life. I think so. I mean, the State of the Union address is an important opportunity for the president to roll out priorities, uh, not just looking backwards and reflecting on the last year, but also to reflect on the remainder of the term. And I think given all of the things that are going on in the world um, that don't necessarily focus on black communities, this is just another window into, you know, the minds and the priorities of the administration that may, you know, give black folks uh, some hunger and appetite to learn more about what the president's going to do to improve their economic situation um, in the country. So uh, I think, you know, folks, I don't, I don't know if I'd say they're necessarily waking up. I think they've kind of been awake or busy trying to survive throughout this uh, economic and public health uh, crisis we've been living through the last couple of years. I think they're super eager and hungry to see how this administration is truly going to put their priorities front and center. All right, everybody, we're back. And I'm going to um, open up my brother line so we can get him back in here. So we're going down in economics now. Uh, brother Stanley Scott, you on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was just listening to uh, the young man. Uh, <laughs> that's funny, because that. as, as you get older, that's <laughs> uh, I'm tired of hearing this, our problem. I'm saying no one is addressing the money that is owed to us. Now, I, I, now I want to uh, I clip, um, everybody hear me. Everybody's talking about African Americans, and nobody's saying anything about the money. We know for a fact, yeah, well, they know for a fact that they took our money, but nobody's talking about that. Come to All right. the African-American well, uh, what, what? Okay, if they, <clears throat> all right, we'll say that they, they owe us. Now, uh, how do you propose that? they pay us. Uh, do you want them to pay us in the American dollar, or would you like to have it in silver and gold? How do you see it? Well, to be honest with you, there are some of things. For example, uh, when it comes to student loan, pay them out, uh, and every African American that want to go to school, they should be paid in That's one because uh, you know for a fact, and, uh, uh, we both know for a fact, that giving some people, most people today, some money is just going to go through their hands into somebody else's hands. 
So you have to put some some requirements for uh, getting money. Depends on your situation, your situation in life, and what you're planning to do. Uh, but that's something that needs to be figured out. The leadership in the African American, we should have already have those plans in action. Yes, whether we get the money or not, we need to be looking at collective economics. Because when we look at it, the data says. Sound like, sound, like yeah, yeah. sound like you're breaking up. And it sounds like you're breaking up. Okay. Okay. What about that? Is that better? Uh, that better? Say something else now. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the African American community, is that better? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the African American community, we we know for a fact there's a, about a two million African American business. Eighty percent of them only have one employee, so they're not growing. Most of them got a a gross uh, income of about a sixty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So, and then we are backing up. We are regret when it comes to in people be talking about uh, we making money. That's true. If you look at the numbers, and that's very important. But there are things that we can do by ourselves. The first one is, no, second thing we need to do is stop with that uh, race, that race with Caucasians talking about how much money they have and what we don't have. And the reason for that, we need to be running our own race. Yeah, we need to, we need to focus on ourselves because there's no way in, in hell well, sorry about that. No way. There's no way for us to close that gap when they have uh, a 200 years of our money. You mean our uh, sweat equity, our <coughs> energy, <coughs> uh, and they had uh, all these years of uh, free labor and all this right here. But then, uh, Stanley, what we have to look at is the fact that the United States uh, filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy in uh, 1933. Uh, they called for all of uh, Americans to turn in their gold to help with the wall effort and made it against the law for you to use silver and gold, which is real money, uh, for legal tender. All right? Now, then they issued uh, paper currency for you to use in exchange for that and so when we use the term money and uh, a dollar bill my question will have to be well how much silver and gold is backing up and a dollar that you have and so we come to a situation now where because like today right here in Jacksonville Florida we got the uh Florida and Georgia game going on, all right? Now, they got the uh, RVs coming to town. So here come all of these folks down the road with two and three and four hundred thousand dollar RVs to watch a football game. So my question is, <laughs> where are they getting all of that kind of clout from in order to do that. Well, you might discover that they know something that's been available to everybody that we don't know in order to get this kind of stuff. They may not have paid not one thing or dime for them. They may be living in three and four hundred thousand dollar homes and have not paid one paper, dollar, for nothing, they may be using their credit because that's the only thing we got left in the United States. And uh, if we got Fort Knox, then if we have Fort Knox, then Fort Knox is supposed to be where all the gold at. And that means there should be enough gold in Fort Knox to cover every dollar 
that anybody got in their pocket in America. And you know as well as I know that that is a lie. So uh, there's something going on uh, that we uh, need to uh, consider. And I pretty much gave you uh, a breakdown on the situation. Uh, we, it was public and private. And uh, uh, we ain't got no money, but we got some credit. But how do you go about using that? So um, uh, 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 if, if you got something else to add, go ahead, and I'm going to bring in this other plug because I, I want to uh, bring this little uh, portion out so we can uh, consider that. What else you got, man? Well, I got, I got plenty of uh, information, but the most important thing is no matter what we deal with, we're dealing with uh, family, uh, education, uh, preventive health, or collective economics is still going to boil down to a few people coming together with a plan. Yes, a plan of action. Not, not. We got. We can't operate with five and six plans. We we need to have one main plan, just like the Jews have, just like the the Hispanic have, just like the Asian have. They got a economic plan that they follow. We are not doing that. Okay, but, but let me ask you something now, because you mentioned something that's been an enigma to me for a long time. What exactly, and, and can you specify this for me, what exactly is a Hispanic? What is that? Well, Help me Hispanic, most of them. Well, Latin, if you want to give another word okay. for it. Okay, all right, well, all right, all right, all right. Well, I tell you what, let's uh, uh, we'll take another little quick break and we'll be back, okay? Okay. Hold on a minute. A new report has put a number on the economic disparities black Americans face. The report by McKinsey and Company found 19% of black families in the U.S. have a negative net worth. The research also reveals a wage gap in the billions and a revenue gap for black-owned businesses of more than a trillion dollars. So for more on this, we want to bring in Shelley Stewart III. He's a partner at McKinsey & Company where he leads the Institute for Black Economic Mobility and he is one of the authors of this report. Thank you so much for joining us, Shelley. It's a really good snapshot of where we are now. I said at the top of the show that, uh, you know, Juneteenth being a national holiday is great, but uh, there's still a whole lot of other stuff that we need to do. Um, so let's start with this negative net worth. How do so many black families have a negative net worth? What is driving this? Absolutely, and thank you very much for, for having me and for your coverage in general of, of this Juneteenth. Um, celebration and reflection. The reality of it is there's a certain cost to live, right? There's a cost to uh, have a home. There's a cost to uh, provide your food, uh, family with food and with health care. And when you have low wages and you, you identified it early, there's a $220 billion wage gap in this country between black Americans and white Americans. When you don't have big inheritance, there's a $200 billion annual inheritance discrepancy every year that flows or doesn't flow to black Americans. You got to borrow. And when you borrow and you don't have enough income to pay that down over time, you end up with negative net worth, and that disproportionately impacts black Americans. Your report also found there's a $220 billion wage gap annually for black workers. Uh, which jobs or fields have the biggest disparities? And my sense is that this is historical, right? I mean, you know, you hear oftentimes the narrative is, look how far we've come. And, you know, we elected a black president and we have, you know, CEOs that are, that are black and brown. But when you look at the numbers from your report, it actually shows that things are in some ways economically at least getting worse. Yeah, Vlad, your, your, your point is, is spot on. And we took a, a holistic look at the black experience through the different roles and found that disparity shows up everywhere. You, you mentioned the $220 billion wage gap. That's both a lack or underrepresentation in a number of different occupations and then also lower pay within an occupation. In terms of some of the, the different occupations that I would highlight, we need more black lawyers, black teachers, and black doctors. Significant portion of the gap can be closed in just those three professions. And by the way, it's not just about the wages that flow from that. There's lots of downstream implications for the way students experience a classroom, 
the way patients experience medicine and the way individuals experience the criminal justice system. So we need more folks, uh, more black folks in those professions. Um, you wrote that there's a $1.6 trillion revenue gap between black owned and non-black owned businesses and that only 2% of private businesses with more than one employee in the U.S. are black owned. Explain how you came to these numbers and what they mean. Yeah, that was, a, that was, I think, a particularly surprising finding. I mean, we expected it to be lower than our share of the population, but 2%, I think, was surprising for everyone. So what this means is, if you look across sectors, there are too few black businesses, and the businesses that operate are smaller than they should be. There's huge opportunities in uh, wholesale distribution and in manufacturing and in professional services. And this is important not only because it creates wealth for the owners of these businesses, but we also know that businesses that are owned by black Americans are more likely to employ black Americans, and so it has downstream implications for workers as well. If things were at parity, we'd have another 600,000 uh, black-owned businesses uh, generating a, a $1.6 trillion in additional revenue that gets fed back into the communities where black Americans live. Uh, the research also shows many black neighborhoods are consumer deserts. Uh, explain what that means. Yeah, so we looked to, to try to uh, understand the consumer experience, and we looked through the lens of spend, access, and quality. And on this access point, we were really surprised to see how many deserts exist for black consumers, meaning insufficient access to the goods and services. So we found that eight million black Americans, for example, live in food deserts, significantly more likely to live in a healthcare desert, a broadband desert, an affordable housing desert. And so it has implications for the quality of life of individuals, and it also represents missed commercial opportunity for the private sector. Um, so we have this snapshot, and we're just giving people sort of nuggets because it's a, it's a very sort of thorough um, examination. So the next step is how do we fix this? And I know it's a really big question, but how do you fix these disparities? Yeah, I, I, let me give you a few places that I would start. One, we should start with the wage gap. We have got to reevaluate our view of diversity in the workplace and really starts at the front end with recruiting, progression, pay equity. So I, this is well within our control right now to address that disparity. If I move to the business ownership bucket, there's a number of things we can do. We have to ensure that our lending institutions are addressing any bias in their processes, but even more than that, being deliberate about getting capital to these entrepreneurs. Only 1% of venture capital funding today, for example, goes to black Americans. We have to, we have to work and address that. And then lastly, I would say the, the public sector also has a role to play. We have to find a way to invest in the education of our young people that are living in lower, in, uh, lower income communities. Our data found that if you are in a high concentration black school, that's 70% or more, you receive $1,800 less in per pupil funding than a majority or highly concentrated white school. We can make a different set of choices and invest in our young people. Hey, Shelley, I wanted to ask you one more question about the wage gap um, conversation. And you talked about how we needed more, you know, teachers and more lawyers and more doctors that were African American. Um, I I'm wondering, it, when you looked even within those professions, did you see wage gaps even within those professions, meaning, you know, black doctors don't make the same as white doctors and so on and so forth? Because I thought those particular professions are the kind of professions that launch you into middle class or upper middle class. And if there's even a wage gap in there, it makes that struggle even harder. But I don't know if that's true. Did you guys find that? No, you, 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 are, you, are, you are spot on. And, you know, traditionally or historically, those professions were actually the things that initially created a black middle class, which is the irony in the fact that we're still hovering around three to five percent in all those professions when we should be closer to 13. And in those occupations, we have identified a wage gap. And so we have to address both the representation issue, but also the pay equity issue in those fields. So Shelley, this leads me. Um... I think that's a really good point to bring up. Because, you know, often organizations will say, well, you know, we have X percentage of African-American fill in the blank. But if people are not getting paid the same or they're not getting the same uh, opportunities to elevate themselves within that career, then 
you know, it's a, it's a half a step forward, but it's not a full step. Sorry, Vlad, cut you off. No, no, I was going to uh, jump on to your uh, question, uh, Anne-Marie, um, and ask Shelley about the, what you said, Shelley, which was interesting, uh, the creation of the black middle class and what jobs led to that creation. Um, and when you look at the middle class in America post-World War II, a lot of those same jobs were also done by white Americans. Um, but in the generation since World War II into the one that we are here in now, those folks who were solidly middle class, who came from the agrarian classes pre-World War II and were able to vault into the middle class, um, have then subsequently, those white Americans, vaunted into the upper middle classes or even the upper classes. Um, and yet, we've not seen the same jump of black Americans from that middle class post-World War II to uh, the same for their white counterparts. Um, what did you find with regards to that? What, what yeah. that time, why it hasn't worked out in the same way that it has for white Americans? Because it goes to the question, again, that I asked earlier, which, when people, which is when people say, look how far we've come. Sure, there were perhaps no CEOs of Fortune 500 companies in 1945. Shelly, I don't know that there were any black partners of, at McKinsey in 1945. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean collectively that the uh, uh, black and brown people have risen to the same levels as their white counterparts. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Vlad, and I think you, you picked up on the income point. I think the big point on the wealth creation and the middle class really has to do with the creation through home ownership mm. and through rising uh, home appreciation that happened post-World War II, and it's been well documented and, we and well covered that exclusionary lending practices and explicit redlining prevented black Americans from participating in that creation of a, of a robust and healthy middle class. And many of, those, uh, many of those things have calcified and they have knock on effects today. As I mentioned earlier, every year $300 billion of wealth flows to, uh, to, to Americans, uh, or sorry, there's a disparity of $300 billion in the wealth that flows to Americans that black folks just aren't getting, that they should be getting given their share of the population. It's very, very hard to make up for that, that the magnitude of that wealth that's being transferred every year. So Shelley, so, and Anne-Marie, you know this because we've talked about this on this broadcast. Um, again, it's why you, you, know, you get pushback from people when we try to do reports or we talk about redlining, right? And people say, well, that was then. It's not like that now. You can buy a house wherever you want in America. It's a free country. But Shelley, that point is exact. what you just said is exactly what this is all about, right? Um, the fact that, you know, your grandfather or my grandfather or Anne-Marie's grandfather could not buy, they weren't here in this country at the time, but I'm making the point that if they were here in 1945 and they wanted to buy a house in a nice part of Chicago and they couldn't, then what you're talking about ultimately led to the point where we are right now. I think that's right, Vlad. I mean, the, the analogy is, you know, a hundred yard foot race and, you, you know, everyone gets to start at the same time, but some folks are starting 30 yards ahead. And, and so I think it's not realistic and, and frankly a bit intellectually dishonest to, to try to ignore the fact that black Americans were not able to participate until much more recently. And we have to, we have to grapple with that and the implications of that, but we can't ignore it. Such a fascinating study. Um, Shelley, thank you very, very much for, for sharing with us. And I applaud also McKinsey and Company for um, creating the group that you had. Um, it's really important, and I hope to see more of uh, the reporting um, that you.
joined now by Nicole Smith. She's with us in the studio. She's a research professor and senior economist from the Center on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown University. Nicole, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about those statistics that I just ran down. If you had to rank the economic challenges facing the African American community, where would you start? Well, I would say in one phrase, it's economic power and economic opportunity. And we know for a fact that over the last, I don't know, decade or two decades, the uh, recession, the Great Recession of, of 2007 has left all Americans um, disenfranchised and disadvantaged from having lost jobs, from having lost economic power, from having lost their homes. But the African American community was especially hard hit. And, you know, when it's, it's, it's very difficult to recover from that when there's no wealth and there's no opportunity to sort of find a cushion or find an opportunity to build yourself once you've, you've been struck that hard. And, you know, we talk about the fact that throughout history in the United States, which is a, granted a fairly short history compared to other countries, um, general wealth, generational wealth has been passed down differently among African Americans than Caucasian Americans. How does that contribute to this trend that you're talking about? Well, that's certainly true. And if, if, you, if you think about you know, your, your wealth as your economic talents, you know, I'm going biblical on you here, and this talent that you've been given, and you can accumulate that and use it to build for the next generation, we find that if there's nothing to give to the next generation, then that generation starts off not at zero, but sometimes at negative. As statistic for you is that the average African-American household actually only has about 6% of the wealth of the average white household today. So what that means is it's much more difficult for those students to have access to uh, pre-K education, to, uh, to uh, post-secondary education, to opportunities for jobs. They make a lot of decisions based on what their economic circumstances are in the current sort of a survival ra rather it's, than it's thriving. Every day you make yeah. a, a decision. Um, you know, I think about geography in the United States, which of course was affected by the Civil War, affected by the legacy of racism. Do we see uh, the statistics change, whether it's the southern United States, uh, the northern United States, east, west, do we see that play a role? Um, statistics and geography are certainly very highly correlated. So once you look at the southern United States, for example, all of the types of stereotypes that we're talking about are actually much more significant. And of so, course, this is an area of the country that was pro-slavery prior to the it Civil was, War. So, and, and it's much more difficult for, the, for those um, um, opportunities to, to bear themselves out. Um, we found that if you had to uh, summarize some of the challenges, you know, we can go back to education. There's challenges to completion. Mm. There's challenges to attainment. There's challenges to um, obtaining jobs that are, are going to give you that economic power and that economic wealth. And those challenges have not changed significantly over the last 10 or 20 years, albeit it's true that maybe those challenges are also getting more significant because the black-white uh, divide on education is actually accelerating over time. And what do you attribute that to? Well, it's, again, it's, it's part of it has to do with access. So we find that even though more and more Americans are entering college, the American college experience is even more segregated than it was in the past. If you look at the new college graduates or the new entrants into college, we find that 82% of white Americans, of all new white American applicants, are entering the 462 most selected colleges. And we find that 68% of African Americans are much more inclined to go to open enrollment institutions. So we immediately find that access differs, opportunity differs because of that access, and then you can think of what types of jobs you can get also differs if you look at the first earning for African Americans compared to the first earning from the first job for white Americans, there's a $15,000 difference. And that has to do with the types of majors people pursued and the type of institutions they pursued those majors in. So I think it's important for you to keep spreading that message. There's still a lot of people that need to hear that that may not really realize that. Um, where are the opportunities now? I mean, the statistics we heard was fast-growing entrepreneurship, but that could just as easily be because they had to come so far to begin with. Well, necessity is the mother of all invention. Indeed. And when you have a community that's you know, often very strapped for cash, very strapped for 
uh, moving forward, that they need to do something to generate that opportunity. And this is where we get these, you know, these very positive statistics on black entrepreneurship. We, however, find that uh, of all businesses in the United States, only 2% of them are black owned. For a population that's 11% of the entire community, it's still not enough, but you know, we're, we're getting there. All right, Nicole Smith, thank you for that ray of hope. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back, and our special guest tonight is uh, Brother Stanley Scott, um, and we're talking about our health uh, as a nation of people, and we are talking about our economic future, and uh, we're dealing with uh, public and private. I'm going to bring my guests back in, but before I do, let me make an announcement. Tomorrow night... Uh, on Morris Talk Live 100, right here on Block Talk Radio. Me and Dr. Walter Williams, uh, he'll be my special guest in here tomorrow night. And uh, we're going to be uh, discussing this thing about uh, the myth of Muhammad. <laughs> uh, we'll be doing that tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so make sure you tune in and uh, so we can uh, get that done. And after that, uh, uh, Sunday will be going, and then... Um, I'm going to be uh, calling uh, Brother Scott. I also have a sister that's going to be uh, coming in later on down the road. Uh, she hasn't let me know when she's going to do it. But we're going to be dealing with uh, astrology, the zodiac, and our, our ancient science and all this stuff. But anyway, let me open up the line and uh, see what my brother doing. Stanley, are uh, you still with me, brother? Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I've been listening to information that they received mm -hmm. from the think tank, man. Uh, what they're talking about, they are way off, way off. What I mean by that, they are talking about, but what about the solution? What about the solution? I don't hear that. Well, give us, give us the solution. I'm sorry? Give, give us the solution. No, one of the solutions where we spoke uh, a minute ago was for the this, this, uh, American students who want to go to college, go for free. We get a free ride. That'll be one way. Number two, you have to talk about some of that money. They're going to have to give up that money because it's too much damage has been done. For, for 200 years, the Caucasian community has been the African American community. Yes, that has to be addressed. Then, then there's a, a level of education. Education for African Americans needs to be taught by African Americans from zero up to by the three. Because we see. One of the biggest problems with African American students are self esteem. Yeah, believing in themselves. Because we know once they believe in themselves, they can do anything in the world. We know that for a fact. We got history to show that. We we have them in, in the country and around the world doing that in small numbers. But if the, if they were given access yeah, equity, along with uh, access, they can get it done. But we also have to come back on number four, the African-American community, man. That classism, that classism. Since 1970, we have African-Americans who have uh, made good money off affirmative action and other government programs, and now they have come up with class. They looking down on certain on mid mid a uh, mid class mid, middle class African American and below. So that part has to be addressed too. Because everything is not about racism. Now, when, like I say, when it comes to economics, if you are in a country and you are get they say a close to two trillion dollars and you are not saving any of that money, then that's on us. That make a big difference. So it's about five or six things that need to take, uh, not just one. Okay, well let, let me let me ask you right here. Now you 
<clears throat> uh, you say uh, that the United States of America Corporation owes us. Um, do you want, do you think, do you believe that uh, we'll say that the United States will, okay, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to, uh, uh, we're wrong, we apologize, and we're going to pay you. Uh, do you think that, how do you feel like they should go about paying us? Do, should they pay us uh, in fiat currency? Uh, silver and gold, which is real money. Um, why not just uh, give us probably about uh, 975,000 acres of land and uh, maybe uh, $50,000 per man, woman, and child and let it go at that? Which, which way you think uh, they ought to go about doing that thing? Or uh, should they... Uh, give us reparations for us going along uh, with uh, what is being said for a whole lot of years about us being uh, on this land, coming from somewhere else, uh, 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 Africa, and it was reparations. How do you think that ought to go? Well, it's so complex now that it's, like I said before, there's four or five things that need to take place, take place. because giving, well, you can't uh, say you go give me what it's due to me and know that I'm going to fail, too. So that means you're not genuine. And what I mean by giving people, the majority of African Americans at this present time, the money, they're going to spend it. So... If I was in position and had something to say about it, it would start with the education part first, too. Yes. And number two, I definitely want to put this on, on the thing. That very few people look, uh, think about that. But when you go get put in jail, they are making money. I'm talking about they're making a lot of money just to go through the process. I'm saying you may get... Uh, you may get uh, give an opportunity to go on your own. Uh, that's not the term I'm looking for, but uh, what I really mean that even after you uh, found that you're not guilty, you still have to pay. It's so many words. And often, if they just stop that, that will make a big impact because we have a lot of good brothers and sisters who may get in a little trouble. And I ain't talking about no bad, I ain't talking about no felony, but that stuff be adding up. And I just wanted to put that in the mix, too. But really, it's, a, it's about six different things that need to take place. But we definitely have to get our leadership. Before they get any money, we have to get our leadership squared away because we're still dealing with that issue by classism. You got them bougie, which I'm saying by 10%, uh, bougie African Americans that some of them are Republicans, Nothing gets Republican, but I'm calling it the way it is. They look down on African Americans, so you have to make sure the right people get the money. And a lot of people don't understand that part, but that's very important. Okay, well, uh, what I'm trying to get to, uh, because you you didn't answer now one of my questions. Let me let me ask you this. Okay, uh, first of all. If you are an African American, can you describe for us what, give us a breakdown on what that identity means. What is an African American? Because the way I see it, now this is my personal opinion, if you are an African American, that means that uh, one of your parents uh, originally an indigenous to Africa, and the other parent uh, is indigenous to America, to America, to the Americas. So could you give me your take on what is an African American? Really, when it comes to that just as for identification purpose, 
Now, and when I say that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's correct a term for it, but after you have been dealing with call all kind of different names here, that for as far as I'm concerned, that's the closest thing to Africa. Uh it was really if it was wrapped up to me, it would just be Africa. Whether you in America or the Caribbean, whether you in, in Africa, it would make a difference to me. Uh but that, that's just all right, so I just you, keep... you 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 believe that uh, uh, civilization and life itself began on the continent of Africa. Absolutely. Okay. All right. But go ahead on and finish uh, telling me what you. But I'm also. Uh, but I'm also not. To, uh, I'm also not think that uh, the land mass what we're talking about. You're going back millions of years was together. Yes. A lot of people don't want to uh, know that, but uh, the point the point is the main point here. Which the question here is, I was saying, when it comes to 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 African Americans really understanding what is taking here, and when it when it comes to money, you have too many different categories to address. I'm, I'm just trying to get make sure I understand your question though uh, about the the money. Okay, well I I pretty much uh, gave it to you. Uh, <laughs> America ain't got none of that. Uh, but what I wanna what I want you to do for me, could you because at the top of the broadcast uh, you told us that uh, you descended from the Gullah Geechee's and that you had uh, been on this land and your descendants have been on this land for thousands of years. Could you give us everything that you know about the Gullah Geechee? So for the first time, if we don't know about them, we'll have an opportunity to know now. Uh, give us what you know about yourself and your ancient story as Gullah Geechee. Well, Gullah Geechee, what I understand, comes to uh, from Africa. Across the across the tip uh, of a, uh, what we see in America, across from Africa to Europe, then to the uh, and came on down uh, for the Gullah Geechee. And we, uh, our family, go back over fifteen thousand years. So we was also traveling these uh, cities uh, from Africa to what we call uh, not, what to be North America. Uh, like I say, through Newfoundland, come on down uh, to the East Coast. Uh, because we were the ones that really fed the, uh, y'all call the pilgrims. We the ones, what the ones, were no uh, uh, Indians. A lot of people didn't know in America, but by the time they get down to Florida here, a lot of them, African Americans, they would call them Indians. But with the Gullah Geechee people, we run from uh, North Carolina all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida. And we go, we was more on the coastline. So we would stay 30 miles inward. To the uh, to the coast, because the Gullah Geechee folk, them Caucasian for a hundred years. A lot of people don't know about that. The Hundred Year War by the Gullah Geechee. So we have been around a long time, uh, our people, uh, and we have created a lot in in America. Because, like I say, we were traveling the seven seas. We were doing karma all up and down the coast. Uh, we had families all up and all down the coast. Uh, but the majority of it at the present time, like I say, North Carolina to St. Augustine, Florida. Okay, now, so you say the Gullah Geechee was here 14,000 years ago. Is that, is that the number you gave me? Uh, uh, Alone, yes. 
Okay, now when the girl of uh got here, you're saying that they came across the Atlantic from Africa on a boat and landed we, in America's Pookie, huh? No, I'm I'm trying to think of the countries. Uh, Surly, Surly, Liana. Uh, when we went from Africa, we came down to Newfoundland, 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 come on down the camp, down to where we are now. Okay, well, where are you now? The majority of us are from North Carolina all the way down to St. Augustine. So we run all up and down that way. You'll find a came of slaves came to Charleston. Yes, my father is from Edison Island, South Carolina, but his people was already here. Yes. Now, now, now so wait we, a minute now. If, you, if your father... You, you say your father's people were already here. Well, who were they? Yeah. Were they Africans? They were the Gullah Geechee. They, they yeah. were Africans, oh. too. Africans okay. were the, the world from, a, from, from forever. Okay, well, yeah. when the Gullah Geechee came here 14,000 years ago, who was here? When they got here, well, they would say the natives, the native, the little native that was around, you know, uh, the west coast, the yes, native the Indians, na- they, what they called them, Indians, yes. Okay, yes. all right. But there was a, there was there was a, a Asian on the coast over there on the west coast too. Hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, what we're gonna do? We're gonna take another uh, uh, another little break, and then we'll be back because I had to get this last commercial in, and uh, we're yeah. gonna put out a little bit more information, and then we'll be back, and then we're going down to the close. So, mute your mic, and I appreciate you still on that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to our final commercial break, and then we're gonna go in with uh, a little bit Hello, more information, everyone. and then we'll be back. Things are changing rapidly in our world today. This is the greatest time and point in history to get yourself free from debt and change your status in commerce by moving out of the public and into the private. Being a secured party and creditor is some of what you need to know. Join our mailing list by leaving your email address in the join our mailing list box at thehawkerdebtelimination.org. Mortgage, student loan, credit card, IRS, private banking, there's also some of what you need to know how to achieve. TargetedElimination.org. Don't forget, the greatest focal point in your life is when preparedness and opportunity meet. TargetedElimination.org. Now is the time. Right now. Get out of debt. Welcome to Real Black Country, the Swan Podcast. This is Big BJ checking in. Today's conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about history. We are going to talk, we're going to talk just a little bit about history because I'm just going to just, uh, I'm going to ask some questions to the village. I really just want to sit down and just hang out and shoot the bobo, right? Because uh, we kind of holding off on content for a little while, right? <laughs> In case you don't know, the Real Black Content is Form podcast, as far as the YouTube platform is concerned, we are on our second strike, right? So, you know, if we get one more strike from one of them small hats talking about you breaking community guidelines, we're out of here. (laughs) And just think about the content that we produce. Because we're making the content off the comments, right? It's almost like Nephew. When you look at Nephew channel, I'm talking about our brother Ben X, right? When you look at our brother Ben X channel, brother Ben X loses his channel once every couple of years. He get his third strike, they put him out of here. 
he got to make up the page all over again. Then he gets booted off again. I use Brother Ben X as an example because we know the content that this young man makes. He ain't doing hyper profanity and ain't a bunch of down talking of the original woman and the original man and ain't no twerking, ain't no gun playing, ain't no, ain't none of that. But, you know, this platform is controlled by small hats, right? So it is what it is. Same as the channel that we have here. This would be our second channel, right? And we're on our second strike, and we had a channel before. We had, like, what, 10,000 subscribers. The channel got taken down. <laughs> now we on this channel, you know what I mean? I don't know. We like six to 7,000 subscribers. It's been a go. So oftentimes when you hear me, when we have in our conversations, and I say things to that nature of, uh, we want the comments, I do that on purpose because you can, it's just weird how these channels, and there's so many other channels on YouTube, beloved, these guys are shooting, stabbing, they got young ladies twerking, they, they do their best to down talk black women, and they don't, their channels don't go anywhere. Right, but maybe all that is a different story for a different day. You know what I mean? I'm just saying like, uh, you know, this is why I always, you know, when we have our conversations, right, I always say, make sure you share the content. Make sure you comment on the, and I never ask you to subscribe. I just don't get into that whole subscribe and this and that. Now I want to say, beloved, I would like you guys, if you could, download as much as you could. If you think we had a, a very powerful conversation, you don't want to see go away, download it. You know what I'm saying? Keep it on your laptop, put it on the travel drive, put it on something. That just doesn't go for the Real Black Content is One podcast channel. Anything that you see that you like, because it just shows you that everything is being pushed from the old school libraries to online. But somebody's controlling these online sites, these information, these books, and that can be shut down and taken away. Um, you see what I mean? Right? So just... Um, so that's where we at with that. I don't think uh, I don't think one of our strikes fall off until I want to say October, and then another strike fall off. I think the second week of September. So we've been kind of like hanging out, you know. What I'm saying I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? We've just been hanging out. I, I do want to share this with the family though when we talk about history. Right, I, I do want to share this with the village, with the BC, right, with the camp. Um, I was looking at the comments, and um, when it comes to the topic of black folks being in the Americas before the slave trade, that's like a hot topic. It's a sensitive topic. When you talk about the American Negro, it's very sensitive, right? So we look to Africa, as we should. But there's other places that we should also look to. What do you mean when you say that, BJ? I mean this, right? The thing that black folks, especially the American Negro, that we got to get in our head is see black folks don't have a birth record when I see you as my brother and sister and this conversation is not for devils when I see you as my brother and sister when I call you the black man I'm not doing it based on this is a racial classification put together by the United States government yeah that's a part of it but it, it is a racial classification the term black, when I'm saying it, beloved, means original. I'm calling you the original man, beloved. I'm calling you the original woman, sis. So what I'm saying when you hear me say the original man is you don't have a beginning. You got to, if you don't get nothing, you, you got to, there have to be a foundation. Black folks don't have a beginning. Go to Google. If you don't believe your brother, go to Google. <laughs> Everybody, Google, who is the, uh, let me see, how can I put the words together? Let me see. 
Who is the oldest people on the planet? Maybe Google that. Uh, Google uh, what is the oldest skin tone on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Google uh, who's the oldest human. You can I don't know. You can Google whatever you want. Whatever answer they're going to give you, they're going to give you an answer with the original man and woman, the black man and woman going to be at the top. Right? Now, this is the part that I think this is the missing piece to what our people don't get. If you were to Google something and it says, oh, the oldest man came from Africa. The oldest skin tone came from Africa. The oldest people group come from Africa. All right, that's cool. And then they're going to tell you some number. A hundred thousand years. A million years. Ten million years. A hundred million years. They throw these crazy numbers. And nobody was on the planet. I'm talking about devil. There was no devil on the planet a hundred million years ago. And if there was a such a time as a hundred million years ago, nobody was here but you and I. You got to, that has to really register. All right. The missing piece is this, beloved. When they talk about Africa hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago when all humans was there, there was a time in the planet's history where these land masses was just one. This is the missing piece our people always seem to miss. There was a time, beloved, where all these land masses was just one. We had rivers, lakes, streams, creeks, but the land mass was one. It was a supercontinent. It was just one. The original man and woman, I submit to you, beloved, we lived on the top side of the land. Something happened along this planet's history. We don't know what it could, some volcano, some meteor, some something. But something caused a split, and now we have what the devil would say, we got seven continents. But it was not so in the beginning. It was just one. When these land mass split, there were people already living on the top side of these land mass. There were animals already living on the top side of these land masses. Because if the the world began with seven different continents, there's no way that there would be animal life in South America. How would the animals get there? If life began in Africa, your life, my life, animal life, tree life, vegetation, seed life, who's in South America planting the seeds for it to be anything there? How would the animals get there? How would most birds? How would most of these birds get there? We know birds. We say as we say they fly south to the but goddamn, we the birds gonna fly over the Pacific Ocean, over the Atlantic Ocean to get to the Americas? No, beloved. The way the reason we have animals on all seven continents because the animals was on the top side of the land when the planet was just one landmass, and then when it split, animals took part of their natural borders. But they had natural borders before the splitting is what I really want to say. Right? Animals lived, well, let me use this as a better example. Lions lived in this portion of what we may call Africa, going all the way to the backside of India, before the split. And then you may have the leopard and the jaguar coming all the way down to what we call, like, South America today, before the split. So when the split happened, everybody just, they held what they got, as the old timers say, hold what you got. But during the split, people groups, the original man and woman, we were displaced on these different continents after the split. Now, I don't know how you're going to receive that, beloved, but that's how this is the position that this platform is coming from. So if you go, uh, let me use this as an example. Um, all right, take this out. There's a book called The History of the Negro Race in America. Uh, I think uh, I've used this source before. I think this is George Williams, right? George Williams talks about, um, in this book, I can't remember the page and all that. 
when the devil was building New Amsterdam, the New Netherlands, right, which we know is this is the east coast of the territory that we call the United States, New York, right? New York, the tri-state area, let me say that way. When it wasn't doing well as a colony and as a state, they had to import slaves to make it pop. But they got the slaves from Brazil. They didn't get it from Africa. They got black folks from Brazil. The way they kind of try to coach us through this whole slave story is that Brazil was populated only with black folks from Africa. They were shipped in. Before they were shipped in, it wasn't there. All right. We don't say that on this podcast. We don't believe that. That's a bullshit theory. It doesn't even really make sense. You know what I'm saying? What we're saying to you, beloved, is, uh, <laughs> beloved, there was a time that South America and Africa was just one spot. And the center, we call that Negro land. Brazil coming all the way to Ghana, Nigeria, and Angola, and all these. All of what you see in West Africa and Brazil was connected. It was just one spot. And then it broke off. Now, today, if we take a look and we see the splitting of the seven continents, we can say, all right, the Pacific Ocean covers uh, 68,634,000 square miles. We can say the Atlantic Ocean covers 41,340,000 square miles. We can say the Indian Ocean covers 29,321,000 square miles. We can just go boom, 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 boom. We can just do the actual facts all the way down the line. Bang, 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 bang. We can do that easily. All right, beloved, what I'm saying to you, though, is there was a time that from Nigeria to Brazil, but before then it was a connection, and in my estimate it was a slow, gradual shift in which now we have the Atlantic Ocean covering 41,340,000 square miles. But it wasn't like that in the beginning is what we're saying. It was just one landmass. During the split, black folks, we are already on top of Brazil. So if we go do the numbers today, and we'll say, all right, well, how many black folks? Go to Google, because our people love Google now. If you say, well, how many black folks is in, uh, in Brazil today? They'll say 120 million, 115 million. Beloved, you, we can't be so naive. We thinking they shipped all these folks in and these folks just populated over. What? There had to be our people already there. So when they did bring our African brothers and sisters over, they mixed in with black folks that was already there. Then we talk about British colonial America, right? Many of these slaves that we get in the territory that we call the United States, most of them came from the islands. Most of them came from Brazil. And then most of them came from one plantation down from Louisiana. They just, carry, they just ship these folks back and forth, and they playing a the mind game. And now when we get on the history books today and we open it up, everybody's from Africa. Now, if you ever hear me say everybody's from Africa, I'm saying all that to say this. I'm not talking about the Africa you're talking about. <laughs> if you ever hear me say all of my people from Africa, I'm saying it in a sense of, well, hell, you can call it Africa, you can call it South America, but all these spots was just one. The wilderness of North America is technically Northwest Africa because America is Northwest above Africa, which makes South America West Africa. But in the conscious world, we call it all Asia. So when you look at your lessons and they say, who was the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, father of civilization, God of the universe. When that's in your lessons, when we say the Asiatic black man, we ain't talking about Bruce Lee and them, Asia, Asia, like y'all know today. Asia just means to us the planet Earth. The planet Earth is Asia. All the Earth is Asia. All the Earth is Asia. So now, you know, if somebody comes along and says, you know, there's a certain tribe that went into the jungles of West Asia, you say, yeah, they went into Africa. But if you also have the understanding to know, beloved, that Africa and South America is one, and we see the biggest jungles is in South America, 
maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. But maybe that's a different story for a different day. See, only Lost Bounds is going to catch that part. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That part is for the 17 million. You know what I'm talking about? That part is for the 17 million, beloved. I'm, the 17 million, we're going to have to have a conversation about that. Right? We're not talking about the whole family, the 4.4 billion. We're just talking about the 17 million. And again, if um, a certain tribe, right, and this is for the lost found. If there's a certain tribe that went into the jungles of West Asia, beloved, right? The jungles of West Asia in South America and Africa is connected, then that will help you make it, right? That's going to make a little bit more sense to the lost found. But maybe that's a different story for different day. When I'm just talking to the village, though, right, um, that's the position that we're coming from on this podcast. That's the position that we're coming from on this platform, right? And then I'm gonna, I want to open up this door for this as well. The breaking and splitting of continents is not over. It's not done. When we talk about the wilderness of North America, if you got you some money, buy all the property that you can buy in New Orleans. New Orleans is on its way to being an island. It's going to shake and bake from Louisiana. It's going to be an island. Um, from California to the Solomon Islands, there's 70 islands in between. That wasn't the original. Those places broke off. And I can submit to you, beloved, that before long, California would not be a part of the west coast of the United States. It's going to break off, and it's also going to become an island. Maybe one of the biggest islands that's United States territory, because it's going to be California. So I'm saying, beloved, the splitting of these is not over. Um, what we know today is Africa. At, there's parts of Africa, I'm talking about East Africa, is on its last leg. Man, they've been doing studies on NBC News for the last 15, 20 years. That con the, the continent, the east side of Africa, is peeling apart. Man, they got it all. They got it on satellite. They showing the rift coming through villages and towns, and, and then you see the river bubbling up through the rift. So there's a part of Africa that we know today that that one plate we put on, like back in the day we had the medallion. No, beloved, it's not going to. I mean, we got, y'all got Google. Let me just say it that way. That saves me some time. Y'all got Google. Africa's still splitting. What we know as East Africa, that shit coming, that whole thing's going to come apart. Do your research. You'll see that's what it is. So, yeah, beloved, that's just what I wanted to share with the family. That's something we're going to have to have a deep conversation on. Your people, beloved, always lived on the top side of these lands. Right. You know, when I was first coming to certain information, to certain knowledge, um, you know, the thing about us, unfortunately, is that we don't challenge a lot of stuff. We don't question it. You know, the devil, he comes around and uh, he talks and he, he say, he's not. And I'm going to be honest with you. And I, I want you guys to really be honest with yourself. Right. I, I want you to be honest with yourself. Me of these folks that we meet, they're not they're not very intelligent people. They're not. But we gotta give credit where credit is due. When we start dealing with the devil, he's good at war. He's good at that. He's good at producing imageries. He's good at lying. I think uh I would give him that trophy. He's like the best liar on the planet. He's good at colonizing, he's good at that. He's good at rewriting history, and he's good at making himself bigger than what he is. Like, he's very good at that, right? So even when I give him credit as being a man of war, he, um, the way he puts the camera, he films the wars that he has with black and brown nations over the planet, but it's always lopsided. He is a big nation, and he, he bullies smaller nations. 
But when he has to go toe-to-toe with a nation his size, it never happens. You know what I mean? He's, it's interesting how this guy works. But he's, he's, he's very good at technology. Obviously, he's good at technology because he got black folks in America thinking they all came off the holes of a ship somehow. And then he will come back and tell you years later, you know, oh, we brought 300,000 slaves to the hills of North America. And then you're like, damn, dog, but it's 50 million of us here. All of us, we are stemming from that 300,000? Because he switches the story. When W.E.B. Du Bois was around, and I want to submit you this, because we're just talking out. We shooting a bubble. We don't have no real conversation. Just something we going to, because they already on, they got us on our second strike. You know what I mean? So it's like, I mean, we don't want to just start dropping content and the channel won't even last for another week. So we just like, yo, we can just, <laughs> you know, we got to come out and talk to the family and say something. But this is what's really going on with us on this side of the fence, right? Maybe that's a different story for a different day. With W.B. Du Bois was walking around speaking and teaching our people and writing books, it was his estimate that there was 100 million Africans from Africa to the Americas in the process of the slave trade. Now, we didn't know to question that. How many boats does that take? We didn't really understand the full logistics of that. Damn, that's a lot of goddamn boats, 100 million. So there's certain parts of movies that would slip that in, 100 million, 100 million. I remember watching the Malcolm X uh, series, or not series, pardon me. Uh, it was a three-hour film by Spike Lee, and that's how they opened up the prison scene. But one of the brothers schooled in Malcolm and said, man, that devil brought us in chains, a hundred million of us. And we didn't fathom, goddamn, how many million is a hundred million? You know what I mean? We didn't, a hundred million people? We're talking forcibly now. Forcibly. So I'm like, okay. And then later, there's a new uh, W.B. Du Bois. He's called Henry Gates. And when Henry Gates get the microphone and he has a stage, he said, well, it was 12 million brought. 12 million? I said, well, damn, that's a big drop from goddamn 100 million. None of us never stood up as a community and said, well, what happened to the rest of the 80 million plus? So that's a big goddamn, you just lose 80 million folks. And then now when they split it up and they used to say, well, 10 million went to South America, they don't even say that no more. Now they say 5 million. 4 million went to South America and then 300,000 came to the middle like well wait a minute <laughs> the devil's a liar but he's not even a good liar <laughs> see he knows you in the hells of North America don't talk to your brother in South America and you do not talk to your brothers on the island because he gave everybody a different story it's going to have to come a time check it out black Americans is going to have to start studying South American history, slave trade history. Then our brothers in South America are going to have to start studying the history of slavery as it is written to the American Negro in the hills of North America. And when we do that, that's going to open everything up. So we don't. I, I'm not. I can't really get into the whole foundation of Black America thing just yet. This whole, oh, this guy's a tell that no, 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 I don't, we don't need that bullshit just yet because we haven't even sat down and just talked about what we need to talk about to get some things on it. We know we haven't, so we can't just start Xing each other out now. But I do agree with this foundation of black America thing because to an extent when it comes to talking about business, some of our brothers and cousins shouldn't get in our immediate business when we're dealing with this beast. We got to let everybody have their own thing with the beast. And we don't need nobody interjecting into that because even I got my brother from West Africa. There were some things going on in Nigeria, beloved. And I made a comment to my brother, my Nigerian brother. I was like, hey, man, I think y'all should do this. And I guess he was getting agitated. He said, hey, V, hey, man, why don't you go fight some pit bulls or something? <laughs> Listen to me, beloved. <laughs> my West African brother. When I was engaging and commenting on his affairs from the nation that he belonged to, he said, bro, why don't you go and fight some pit bulls or something? In other words, this ain't even your business for you to be commenting on, bro. You know, he's a Nigerian Negro. You're an American Negro. Brother, don't get in my... 
I couldn't do number respected. I laughed it off. I couldn't do number respected. So there should be some borders and barriers when we're talking about dealing with the beast. I get it. Outside of that, though, for information purposes, we got to deal with our brothers and sisters and figure this thing out because you will learn, beloved, the same game he played on us. You know, this is the slaves. And then he played a, um, this is the free people of color game. And these are the free Negro game. He played with that in North America. He did the same thing to our brothers in Brazil. These are the free uh, African slaves. These are the uh, enslaved African slaves. And then there's a term he said, these are the runaways. Right? Now, what I'm submitting to you, beloved, is this. When these continents split, black folks is on top of the continents already. Now we come in contact with devils, and then that term runaway slave means something. Yeah, I'm a runaway, of course. You're trying to capture me in my own spot, and I'm running away. If you brought me to this general, if you brought me to this zone on the ship, where the hell I'm gonna run to? Can you? I can't run. A, you can't. If somebody put me in my whole community on the ship and took us to the backside of South America, what, what we gonna run to? Run away? Where? Man, we looking at all them jungles, and we like, man, hell no. I ain't gonna. I'm cool. I just take my chances with this devil and just play it sweet, cause I don't know what's in his forces. I can't just run out there like that. I don't know how to eat, capture food, make food. I don't know. That runaway word is very, see, it's different. I can't run away unless I know the land. Or I'm just stuck with you, bro. I can't run away. Maybe that's a different story for different day. How about that? I want, you know, I want you to think. Question the story for yourself. Question the story for yourself, because one thing this podcast have never said, it was only black folks in the Americas. I never said that, beloved. What I really said is, the Americas haven't changed much in my estimate. The brown man is still here. He was always here. These Mexicans, they didn't come from nowhere, man. They was always here. These red folks, they was always here. They came a little later after the black and brown man, but they was here. South America is South America. That brown man always lived in South America, but we did too. We did too. That's all I'm saying, yo, we did too. And we can't let the man that come last tell everybody what they was and what they place was. And No, but this, you was in caves in Europe somewhere, and you on your way back to the caves. Because this is what that global warming stuff is all about. We ain't worried about it. You know what I'm saying? We don't have an issue with the sun, beloved. We good. The brown man don't have an issue with the sun. They're good. You're not good. <laughs> oh, take a DNA test. Hey, man, y'all better stop giving these folks y'all DNA for all this and all that, beloved. Uh-uh. Because he got a front story and he got a back story. You don't know what he needs from you. To keep him living here. There's something about this devil. And I'm going to leave y'all with this. He has to live off you. To exist. He's not like you. I know he told you. Oh we all the same brother. When I cut I bleed red. You do too. But the possum bleed red too beloved. Is that your brother? The rat. Bleed red brother. Don't let that devil come to you. The brother minister from Chicago used to teach us that. Hey, don't let him come to you with the red, I bleed red story. He's, he's, he's not like you. You sit in a restaurant with the guy. He walk right in. You got to have your steak well done. He don't have to have his steak well done. They, they, they barely cook the shit. They just slap it on them. My brothers and sisters that listen, y'all are chefs. You guys know. You barely cook cook his shit, he hand it back to him, he eating the meat damn near raw. He's not like you, beloved. It's 20 degrees outside, big mama gave you a coat, scarf, gloves, goddamn big, thick hat, the whole nine, and he out there with a windbreak on. You, you're not the same. You try to support your favorite football team and 
You went to Lambeau Stadium. You a pa- you wanted to be like him. You want to be a Packer. Put your cheese head on, and you got out there to that stadium. It was 15 degrees, and that devil can stay out there for four five hours straight. And you saying, "Hey man, by the end of the first quarter, we out of here." <laughs> You go figure out you're not the same as him. You fat and out of shape, black man and black woman. You fat and out of shape. If you dedicate 14 months, you will come out that gym looking like rock solid cut. Muscles from neck, shoulders, arms, stomach, everything. 14 months is all you need, black man, black woman, to get yourself back in shape. Not him. He's got to go to the same gym you go to. He got 50 fucking supplements. He got protein shakes all over the place. Creatine shakes all over the place. Then he's going to get hit with that juice. Because he can't, his body can't, he's not like you. So Mr. Muhammad came amongst us and said what? Weak bones, weak flesh. Weak bones, weak flesh. Weak man. Weak woman. He's the weaker link. He's the weaker link. So that's how he put his time on this planet. 52 weeks in a year. He had to struggle to make it through. It's 52 weeks for him. We don't have weak weeks. We have 52 strongs in a year, beloved. We don't have weeks. He's living week to week to week. It's a struggle for him to even exist on planet Earth. They're full of medication, beloved. They can't exist without medicine. They have to have some form of medicine just to make it. You go to the black man and black woman, he'd be like, nah, man, I don't want all this. That will frustrate our people taking too much medication. Say, man, goddamn, this ain't what we do. We don't want all this goddamn medicine. He can't exist here without medicine. But that's okay because he could come back around and you would teach you about your life, your existence, your history. Nigga, is you crazy? Man, is that, he's, man, get this devil out of here. He don't know what the fuck he's talking about. Professor James Small always taught us, what well, man, this dude ain't invent nothing but the patent office. He ain't make up shit. He take credit for everything. He don't make up nothing. But the sun is getting hotter every day. His numbers is dwindling every day. This is why he tried to make all around the world, he's trying to pass, stop abortion bills all around the world and create a new disease for the black continent, the Negro continent in which we call Africa. Because he understands Africa is the youngest continent on the planet, aging at average 18 to 23 to 24 years of age. And he understands that Europe Right, where he come out of the caves of is the, what, Europe is 40 plus, the average age of Europeans is 40, and then he knows second behind Europeans is Americans at 35, they're aging and they're getting old and they're going to die out. So he got to get the numbers up so he's passing no abortion bills all over the place. That's what that shit is about. That has, is about nothing else but he's, he's going to fall off the planet. And you can't help this devil stay on the planet. He's gone. He's no. He's no. He's out of here. So now he gotta try to do what he can to keep his seed strong, and he gotta look at the black woman. You finna see interracial marriage go sky high in this country. He's trying to keep his seed alive. He already gave up on his woman. He can't keep his woman. His woman been looking at us since we was on the fields. If you at the bottom, if you ain't got nothing, beloved. They said, oh, they said a black man can't be loved properly if you don't got money. Yeah, he can. That she devil love him. That she devil love him. He ain't gonna never have no problem getting no she devil. We learned that's that's one on one in the hood. If you ain't got absolutely nothing, you can go get you one of them. <laughs> we learned that in the neighborhood. You ain't got to have no money to get one of them. If that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. I'll let you be the judge of that. But his time is, is coming up short. He can't be saved. And then the truth is going to poke itself out. And the only dangerous future that we got as black folks in the Americas is um, if we don't get our shit together, 
instead of having all these unwed babies, we're going to be in some, it's going to get tight, beloved, because he, the brown man and woman, he's next up. He's going to take back the wilderness of North America. He's going to take it back, and he's next in charge. And there's going to be a Pharaoh that know not Joseph. See, that brown man, that's your brother. He don't owe you nothing. You don't owe him nothing, but he don't owe you nothing. You can kind of play a psychological game on devils a little bit. You can play the slavery game, and you can get next to some liberals, and he can front like he helping you. He really hurt you, but he can fake like he helping you, and he can do all of that. But ultimately, beloved, um, that brown man, you can't play that we need reparation game with him. That's why we don't play it now on this podcast, because there's coming a field that know not Joseph now. Meaning, he know not Joseph, he don't have to respect Joseph. He don't respect Joseph, he don't respect Joseph people. And our people is running around like we are the children of Joseph in the wilderness of North America. America is blessed because of us. America is shining because of us. Egypt wouldn't be Egypt if it wasn't for us. Babylon wouldn't be Babylon if it wasn't for us. All right. Well, that Pharaoh going to die out. He's dying out now. And then there's a new Pharaoh arising, and he don't respect Joseph. And he don't respect Joseph people neither. The reason why foreigners can come across the Atlantic Ocean and get past us is because they believe in the family unit that we don't. The black man and woman ain't going to, you ain't going to theology your way out of this situation. Everything you thought you wanted, you got, and you're still where you are because you don't understand that family is your only salvation. The family unit is your salvation. I know somebody came along and they sold you a bunch of saviors from the east. And now when you come to your neighborhood, you got these temples, religious temples from the east, all over the place. On every corner, in between the corner, and your situation will never get better. And then the foreigner come over, he just got a little bit of religion. Just a little bit. He ain't got a whole lot. He just got a little bit. But he do got a wife, and the wife do got a husband. And they can pass you right on up because they're family. And we're still trying to pray our way out and at the same time baby mama our way out and baby daddy our way out of a situation. And that shit ain't going to never happen. We're going to continue to talk about relationships on this podcast, beloved. If your relationship ain't intact, it don't mean shit. Yeah, you the original man, you the original woman, but you ain't tight with your baby mama, that don't mean nothing. You ain't tight with your baby daddy, they gonna mean shit. If you got kids spread all across the city, it ain't gonna mean shit. But it's not gonna mean nothing. It means the foreigners gonna keep coming right in and passing you up. And they gonna leave the dope and the guns for you. And then you gotta go out and play cowboy and but that's okay because as soon as that bullet hits your head, that devil ain't going to let you hit that grave with them organs, beloved. So if you wait for him to come and stop your black on black violence, it's not happening. As soon as that bullet hits your head, your liver going to be gone. Your kidney's going to be gone. You're not going to the grave with that heart. And your mama is not going to go... To the, she's not going to the uh, the local, what do they call that place, uh, the, the funeral home. and She's not making sure your organs is where they should be before you hit that ground. Some organs are already gone. He going, that devil going, he live off, he got to live off you, beloved. I keep, <laughs> he can't, he got to live off you. He's, he, when you get shot in the head over your Jordans and your chain or, or your, you got to, you represent the neighborhood with the devil's name on it. And you this and you that, and when they get that that bullet hit your head, that heart gonna be gone before you can even. And somebody, some small hat, some Irish, Italian, some they walking around with your nephew's heart. He died in a gang war, and they got the heart and the liver and the kidneys and everything else, and they gonna go on with their life because they need you. You're foolish just to keep them on top. When you figure that out, so. Our solution as a people is marriage. That's a revolutionary act, beloved. Marriage is revolutionary. You didn't try everything else. You're doing yoga. You did five times a day. 
bump your head to the east. You then went over there with them sand niggas, and they came back, and they played the whole Muslim game with you. And then as soon as you got back to America, they sold your pork. Is that your brother? You didn't went over there, and you played Israel. And now you're an Israelite, and you didn't bump your head three times a day, and you praying to Jerusalem. And then you get back over to America, and that small hat is... He owns the Jew issue system down there. He keep you goddamn in chains down there. He owns 60% of your liquor industry and you stay drunk. And then he owns Hollywood and he always got an image of you looking foolish. When you gonna wake up? But maybe all that is a different story for a different day, right? Peace and black power to your family. We gonna leave it alone. All right, everybody, we're back. Uh, that was Big Meek uh, bringing in, uh, dropping a little science. Uh, <clears throat> our special guest is uh, Brother Stanley Scott, and I hope he ain't fell asleep uh, uh, doing this uh, podcast and stuff. We're going to go on down. we got 12 minutes, and I got a few questions uh, to ask him, so I'll open up his phone line so we can get on back in and uh, continue. Stanley, you yeah. still with me, man? All right, my man. Give me, give me, give me your take on uh, Big Mick. What you said, man? Would you uh, uh, disagree with? Just well, give me what you me disagree that, with. No, I agree with him. I mean, uh, he was right. Oh, he was cracking me. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was, he was correct. Yeah. But friend, the information that he was sharing. Is exactly what I was saying about he used to land match. Yes. So I agree with him. I don't really have anything to uh, I like to hear more from it. I like to hear yes. Okay, well he's on the uh Black Cautionist Forum uh podcast. You type that into YouTube and you hear a whole lot of stuff on, you know. I just I go in and pick uh, different segments so he can drop some science and uh, help us out. But now, uh, uh, you are my guest on a uh, broadcast night. We're down here in the, uh, in the bottom uh, portion of the broadcast, and we're talking about uh, our economic future. Now, uh, right. my question to you is because it's so intriguing uh, for me to uh, hear from you, you know, me and you, uh, that, why don't we do this right here? First of all, before we get on down in, we got 10 minutes. We got a lot of time, man. Uh, right. Why don't you give the listening audience, I, I want them to hear it from you. Why don't you give the listening audience uh, where we was and how life unfolded for us in the 21st century uh, uh, down in the uh, uh, eighth, eighth grade and coming on up, uh, just me and you, man to man, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and all that. <laughs> let uh, let me have it, man. What you got, man? Come on, tell me what you well, what we did. What, what I got, what I got, what I got is a uh, unity. Uh, coming up with my family, uh, mother and father, yes, uh, sister, siblings, siblings. Uh, working, uh, I'm close to the baby, and my it was 14, 15 of us. So I was able to learn a lot from my sisters and brothers coming up. And when I was in school, education was important, but we also had trade school too. Trade, uh, even in uh, in what we call middle school, it was called junior high school when I was in there. Uh, and and a very important thing to me is very important that uh, one through six was in the elementary. Now that's a big uh, difference. And that's when we really start having the school, school to prison pipeline coming through because uh, they had them young babies out there with the middle class. I mean, uh, first, second grade, not first, not first grade. Sorry about that. Of uh, middle school, middle school, they call it middle school. Yeah, I had them in there in sixth grade. And that's called a big problem. Yes, 
But when it comes to economics here, uh, for, fresh for, for our people here, we just need to learn, some of us, once again, some of us need to learn to work together. Three or four of us need to work together. But like I say, when I was coming up in school, uh, you were looking forward to getting your job. I mean, that you saw your sisters and brothers going to work. That was automatic. And my first job I ever had uh, working at a place called Daylight. Well, I wasn't working for Daylight. I used to carry groceries from uh, uh, David Street, no, from uh, Broad Street over to uh, the project. And I was making a lot of money, too. Yes, a lot of money. Uh, and able to buy my clothes and stuff I wanted for school. Uh, but, yes, another very important thing that I was my, my mother. See, we all had a little job here and there, and we used to give the, the money to our mother, and she never missed a beat as far as the money was concerned. So that's the stuff that I remember when I was coming up uh, around that age. Okay, well, um, tell me about <clears throat> when Paul Wimley hit Warwick of that here with a 38 on Tallis Street. Now, you got to help me with that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, well, wait a minute. I all right, all right. Well, 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 tell me uh, about when uh, Harold Hart and, and company fell off the motorcycle after got a hit down there on Ferndina Slid, almost half a block down on Ferndina Beach. Nah, I... Harold Hard and them uh, uh, was over to school. I came behind them. Uh, but I don't remember that part. You know, that was a good one. Yeah. All right. Well, yes. I tell you what. We finna get off the hook. Tell me about yes. the drive-in that used to be on the corner of Kings Road and Tyler. Damn, man. I, I don't remember that. No, go see what happened. What happened, though? All right. No, all what, right. No. Okay. What well, happened tell me. when I was coming up? No, 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 I was, no. no. <laughs> I, I tell me I don't about, know nothing about that stuff. Tell me about. I, I don't know a thing about uh, Bone and Pobe, po Boy and dubbing them on the motorcycles uh, on Fairfax. Uh, in 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 Ninth Street and Tyler. See, that's what I'm saying. I don't know nothing about that kind of stuff because when I was coming up, every opportunity that I was uh uh I was going down to Miami. Yes. So with my uncle, my uncle used to work for her shrimp car, and when he come from up north, uh, uh here to here and all of them rich area where them Caucasian was living. He come to Jacksonville. He used to take me with him. So I was always with him or uh, my uncle traveling. So I don't know about all that kind of stuff. All right. All right. Well, then November the 22nd, 1963, they shot uh, uh, John F. Kennedy in the head and blew his brains out uh, in, in, in Dallas, Texas. Where was you at, and what do you remember? Now, I, all I remember is Caucasian crime. That's all I remember, because they didn't show too many African-American crime, you know. Uh, so that's the only thing I remember about that. And I also remember, I remember this part, let me see this, that white folks would kill anybody, including their mom and their dad. I learned that now, but I ain't learned nothing else. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to take another little quick break, and we'll be right back. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my special guest is our uh, brother Stanley Scott, and I'm gonna tell you something now. Uh, we was in junior high school together, and we went to high school together. And uh, what I'm finding out is um, a lot of us uh, are not blessed with a fertile mind to contain things and all the missing gaps of time that has happened a, a, a long time ago. It is not that uh, uh, we are ignorant or something like that. It's just that uh, some things we remember and some things we don't. It's, a, it's real, real uh, simple. It ain't uh, uh, complicated at all. But anyway, we're going to take a little quick break, and uh, we'll be back uh, with my special guest. Y'all want to Brother, you, you're doing a job here, fantastic, uh, because uh, a lot of information I learned, and I'm going to be reaching out to you, uh, because I definitely want to go private. Yes. Uh, and I'm a, uh, that was great information, and, and you definitely know your stuff. So we have a, a goal and opportunity here, because we should be able to bring this information together and help some people. Yes. At least it'd be able to have about 200,000 African Americans. Yeah, that's a good number, man. I, I have to agree with you that that's a good big number. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got, I got, I touch about 30,000 myself. Okay. Yes. Well, we're going to discuss this right here. Uh, but anyway, I got to close this down and then I got to get ready for tomorrow night. And uh, so yes. uh, I would like to say I certainly appreciate you being on here tonight, and uh, we're going to talk about it. We'll come back and we'll do it again at a later date, man. I thank you yes. for being on standing. Yes, yes, I will be uh, listening uh, tonight, I mean tomorrow night, too. Yes, check y'all out. All right. Okay. But anyway, 
Let me shut this thing down before they start trying to tax me, man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You you have a good night, man. Ladies and gentlemen, you too, man. <laughs>